call to order the 176th meeting of the New York State Department of Historic Preservation here on June 13, 2019, the Ohio State Park. Uh, we will begin with the roll call. Mr. Chairman, 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 Mr.
resident curator program, there is now going to be uh, the availability of uh, the state rehab credit for historic homes uh, could come into play in terms of enhancing, advancing use of the resident curator program. So we're pleased with that. Also, as a result of the state budget process, uh, the Division for Historic Preservation was authorized for seven critical fills. We're very happy to, um, uh, you know, the hiring process, the interview process is well underway for all positions. Uh, we are adding, uh, restaffing the museum curator, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the museum curator position in here in the Bureau of Historic Sites. Those interviews are underway. Um, we have made provisional staff appointments in the archaeology unit and the National Register unit. Those provisional staff are now permanent uh, on staff. We have additional hires, uh, an additional hire underway in the National Register unit. Uh, we have hired two staff in the tech, uh, in the tech unit, the compliance unit, um, and both will be on board by the end of this month. Uh, and then we have a project manager position for the State Park Survey Initiative. Uh, that it was also authorized as one of these seven critical fills, uh, and we'll be making announcements about that shortly. Um, our poster child for the new hires uh, is Derek Rode, uh, who is here. Derek, if you'd stand up, an awkward first introduction. Thank you. <laughs> um, so Derek comes to us uh, uh, from, with an anthropology degree, uh, an MA in anthropology from SUNY Buffalo, an MS in Historic Preservation from Ball State University uh, and has worked extensively with the SUNY Buffalo Archaeology Program uh, and uh, knows our chair. Um, Derek, we appreciate your joining us from Western New York, making the big move, uh, and we're very happy to have uh, really adding five, five new staff and, and uh, making permanent two other staff here in, in our division. Uh, we have a great team here. Uh, it, is, it is skilled, it is enthusiastic, this is the best part of state government uh, and, and this agency right here at the division. Um, Daniel, this is the, really the most significant uh, increase in staff in quite a long time, isn't it? It is, it is. Uh, we've also been invited to, uh, at the commissioner's request, and this is an agency-wide request, to uh, evaluate other um, uh, additional staffing needs, uh, staffing reorganization here uh, at the division. That's also an exercise that's being undertaken in the region. So we are working to identify uh, potential reorganization, uh, new management steps, uh, new promotional opportunities, and obviously, you know, uh, greater efficiencies and needs and, and where staff and how staff is allocated here. So an interesting exercise is underway. We'll be able to report back on that in September. Um, Mr. Chairman, it might be appropriate later to consider a resolution and in support of and, and in we'll gratitude for these, these staffing increases. Thank you for that um, we have, the agency has signed uh, a license agreement uh, for um, Parrot Hall State Historic Site. Uh, Parrot Hall is a, a very interesting Italianate structure in the city of Geneva. It was, um, it was transferred to uh, the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation in the early 1970s and designated a state historic site. It has never been open uh, to the public uh, for uh, access or use, um, and the agency uh, was very close to sort of making final decisions uh, about um, disposition of that site uh, when uh, a coalition of, of groups, uh, including the city of Geneva, Friends of Parrot Hall, uh, Landmark Society of Western New York, represented today by Wayne Goodman here at the table, Preservation League of New York State, uh, so the signatories to the license agreement are Friends of Parrot Hall and the City of Geneva uh, with support from uh, those two other organizations. Uh, it is a 10-year license agreement to address um, emergency stabilization and repairs to the structure, uh, remediation uh, of, uh, uh, of the structure, uh, feasibility study for reuse of that structure, uh, and um, uh, we're very pleased to see this building have a new opportunity uh, with new partners uh, to help uh, accomplish some goals that the agency itself was not, not able to accomplish uh, over the last uh, few decades. So a very interesting new partnership uh, evolving there. Its problem was that, that there was no additional land. The, 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 the property is right at the foundation line all the way around. And so, and Cornell, I guess, who owns the surrounding land, they just said, well, I'm sorry, we can't. Right. This is a site. So I hope that's overcome the, because it would be very hard to use the, the 
Absolutely. Right. So this is, you know, we, we are in conversation with Cornell. They are supportive uh, of, of these plans going forward. They'd like to uh, see what kind of assets this new partnership uh, brings to the site. It is, it is constrained. Wayne, comment? Just, yeah. Well, just a comment that uh, I think on behalf of the coalition, I would just like to extend our appreciation to uh, you, Daniel, your staff, everyone that's kind of worked on this. It's been a challenge, and I think we have a great road ahead, and we're excited. So thank you. Great. You're very welcome. Um, and so we are anticipating a, a site visit. Uh, the keys to the site are basically being passed over on Friday, and we're expecting a, a site visit that will include DHP staff um, sometime June, late June, early July, ideally. Um, more details at the September meeting, but uh, amongst some of the uh, initiatives that Commissioner Kulisade has undertaken, the Division for Historic Preservation is going to play a major new role in uh, capital allocations to the state historic site system. Um, capital funding within the agency has been allocated on a region by region basis, uh, and now the funding, uh, funding for state historic sites, it's the division that will play uh, a primary role, the primary role in, in those capital allocations going forward. Uh, and so we're very pleased to uh, be able to, um, to, to be able to more fully inform uh, capital spending at the state historic sites because of that decision. Um, we've talked a bit of before about the state parks survey initiative. This will be a three-year project to sur comprehensively survey the state park system, historic structures, uh, landscapes, uh, uh, and other historic features. Uh, we are very close to sort of having final sort of administrative approvals uh, from civil service and division of budget to um, implement that project. Um, we are using one of our critical fills uh, for the project management role for that project, and there will be announcements shortly as to uh, getting that project underway. Um, I want to share two final items, or actually three final items, I guess. Um, in May, the governor announced a reimagine the canals task force. Uh, this is a uh, initiative to recommend innovative strategies for revitalization of the Erie Canal corridor. Um, goals of the effort include identifying potential new uses for the canal aimed at improving the quality of life for New Yorkers, evaluating how the canal can enhance economic development along the canal corridor, finding new opportunities to enhance recreation and tourism along the canal, and assessing how the canal can help improve resiliency and restore ecosystems in canal communities. Uh, the first meeting of the task force is later this month in June. Uh, Commissioner Kulisade has assigned regional directors Mark Mastretta, Rob Hiltbrandt in the central region, obviously Mark in Niagara region, and Elaine Balchinian uh, as agency representatives to that task force, and I will be representing the division uh, in that effort. Um, Finally, I want to conclude with uh, there are four major commemorative anniversaries that are on our radar screens. Um, the 250th anniversary of the Revolutionary War um, uh, will, depending on when and how you celebrate, could be commemorated uh, 2024, 2026 uh, here in New York State. I think we're envisioning a longer commemorative period all the way through at least 2033. Uh, the 200th anniversary of the Erie Canal completion, 2025. The 100th anniversary of the State Park Agency formation, 2024. And then uh, finally, the 200th anniversary of the end of slavery in New York State, 2027. Um, that's an extraordinary um, set of commemorative goals and mile markers, uh, six to eight years out uh, for us here. Uh, multiple staff at the Bureau of Historic Sites have been involved in early internal discussions uh, about preparing the park system, whether through capital investment, uh, interpretive uh, initiatives, new exhibits, and staffing uh, for these future commemorations. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty interesting discussion to undertake now. It's one that's capable of fundamentally informing the levels of investment, capital investment, that state park system needs to achieve uh, over the next decade to uh, prepare the system for these commemorations. There's no point in making capital investments in that system unless we are also talking about interpretive and staffing goals uh, to, to, uh, to live up to that capital investment. Um, and uh, really it's the Revor anniversary that is, is uh, the initial focus. 
um, along with state historian Devin Lander and the State Museum. Uh, there have been two meetings, uh, and in conjunction with parks, there have been two meetings already held for early planning and envisioning for the Rev War commemorations. A third meeting will be held at Ganondigan State Historic Site two weeks from now on Thursday, July 27th. Additional meetings are being conceptualized for Long Island in New York City and likely uh, a second meeting out in central, uh, central New York. But uh, I will keep the commission, or the state review board, excuse me, informed about um, those early planning efforts and we would like to include you uh, as, as, as planning begins to coalesce, we'd certainly like to include you all in um, opportunities to contrib contribute to the thinking uh, and then, you know, what type of ambitions we have for, this, for these commemorations. So thank you, Governor. Yeah, yes. When you were talking about three major commemoratives, I thought you were going to say Stonewall, the moon landing, and Woodstock, <laughs> which, are, <laughs> all, which are all coming up yeah. in yes. June, July, and August of this summer. Yes. <laughs> but maybe we have a couple hundred years. <laughs> uh, moving now to uh, board business and new business, I just have a few announcements before we're going to go to Chuck's. Uh, uh, presentation, a brief presentation. I want to begin by congratulating the St. Louis Blues and winning Game 7 of the Stanley Cup. <laughs> and offer my condolences to people from Boston. Uh, I also want to draw our attention to the attendance and the quorum issue. Um, there's seven of us here. That is the minimum requirement for approving uh, a nomination today. So we have to be careful about that. And it brings up the issue of, of the strength and numbers of the board. And I wonder if, if somebody could comment on um, new board members coming coming through the system. So the uh, agency has offered, uh, has have proffered three names to the governor's office for consideration um, to be nominated to the state review board. Uh, we know at least one name is, is advancing. Carol Clark is one of our nominees. Uh, she has been approved by the governor's appointments office. Her name has been submitted to the New York State Senate. And it is our hope that before the end of this legislative session, and we are expecting another confirmation round that Carol's Clark will be in that round and, and she'll be approved. Uh, we have not yet uh, seen that movement to nomination for our other two uh, candidates at this time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, short term, I think our, our hope is with Carol uh, advancing and being available for contributing to quorum by our September meeting. Thank you. Uh, are, we, are we limited in terms of numbers? I mean, if we have trouble with with the membership we have now to meet a quorum, uh, is there a reason why we can't expand it beyond the size that it's been in recent years? Yes. We were told we can't have, the law says we can only have 13. And uh, so many of the 13 are ex officio. Right. And then there are the ones, and we can't have below. But that isn't the problem. The problem is getting them actually formally nominated and um, confirmed by the Senate. And I know people in other states have said, oh, we just walk them over to the Capitol and get them approved. But that, they don't yeah, work the in New York State government. <laughs> the person? Yeah. They physically walk them? They no, they physically walk the name over. They just, oh, we need a new board member? We'll just walk it over to the State Capitol and get it approved. But it doesn't work that way in New York. We need confirmation. Mm -hmm. Not, and I actually don't know what so long. I think it's getting on the Senate agenda and having a vote. I know, Erica, you've said that you've had. We have a board member proposed for our um, state code council, and I, he has told me he's gone through state police investigations. They've contacted his neighbors. They've interviewed him several times. It's not just walking a name across the street. Yeah, what, what she's and this is a year and a half already. She's describing the background check that's required for board members to go through. It is a somewhat lengthy process. You get fingerprinted by a state trooper. They contact five references. So th the process is extensive. Uh, but one of the real bottlenecks is the actual approval process in the right. state office. Because he didn't make it at the end of the last, mm. last Right, and we've suffered that. OK. Well, we know that's an issue, and hopefully that will get resolved. But we are prohibited from having more So 13 is the max according to bylaws. Under statute. Under statute. statute. Under statute. statute. Okay. Forgive me. Uh, I want to commend Kath and her staff on the quality of the forms we received and when we received them this round. They came early. They're complete. It's a huge help to the board to have these in hand with enough time to look them over 
uh, and to make good comments. So we really, really appreciate that. It's just fantastic. Um, now I understand that in, in keeping with that, some of these have been pushed off to September and I wonder if the list for September isn't going to be pretty extensive and we're going to have a lot to do at that meeting. I just say that out loud so that we can be thinking of it because one of the things we're going to talk about is um, the future meeting at Planting Fields on September 5th and, and how that meeting is going well, to go. Well, I can tell you that, um, well, first of all, you won't have any from Jennifer because she will be on maternity leave. Okay. And so that's why her agenda is maybe, well, is long this time. Uh -huh. And that why I was worried that if we didn't get a quorum, we would be in really big trouble. So, um, however, um, grant candidates have to be reviewed at the September meeting. So you may have some extra uh, work there. So, but the usual um, large number that she brings, you won't have. So I don't think the agenda will be longer. Um, but okay, good. Thank you. But we may have some that have to go, and we may have to. We're gonna have to push to get them through to you. Okay. The other announcement I have is that there's J Cope training today at 1:30 for Erica, Wint, Lucy, Wayne, and myself. My understanding is that other people have access to that elsewhere, uh, and also the issue of conflict of interest policy has come up. Um, do we want to say a word about that now? Kathleen, would you be willing to just mention briefly? Sure. Um, there have uh, been some questions about um, uh, your role as state officers and um, how we determine whether there's potential conflict of interest. <clears throat> and one thing I wanted to say up front is that every case is unique, every situation is unique, so you would have to check with um, Karen Minster, the general counsel, or Petra Larson, who um, both are our ethics officers. Uh, but you are covered by Public Officers Law Section 74. You're unpaid per, per diem members. It's different from other boards where um, they get paid. Uh, they're, they're regulatory and they you know, they look at million dollar projects for bonding or other um, state um, funding. Uh, you're, you're in a different category. You're primarily um, governed, your, your ethics considerations are primarily governed by the code of conduct in section 74 of the public officer's law. Um, I, I, if you want, I could quickly go through those standards and just give you a sense of what what you should be looking out for, which is what we're, we're going to go over in detail this afternoon. Um, what, the, what the standards of conduct require are um, impartiality, maintaining independent judgment with respect to your state job, your state position, confidentiality, understanding the types of information that may be shared with colleagues and members of the public, as well as not disclosing sensitive information to benefit yourself or someone else. Stewardship of state resources prevents you from securing unwarranted privileges or favors for yourself or others based on your state job and not utilizing the resources of the state for your own personal use. Financial conflicts, abstaining from personal investments that conflict with your official duties and avoiding transactions with any entity in which you may have a direct or indirect financial interest. Integrity standards, avoiding situations in, in which it may appear you could be influenced or would attempt to influence someone else and conducting yourself in a manner that does not raise suspicion among the public that you're personally benefiting from your official position. And then the last business with the state, you're restricted from contracting for work and or providing goods and services to entities that are licensed or regulated by your agency and there are circumstances that may allow you to concurrently work for both. And Parks is unique in that we're not a regulatory agency. Um, the situations that you encounter involve um, potential financial interests with companies that you may be involved in. Um, but most of the time, we're dealing with nominations. You're, we need your technical expertise to uh, advise on nominations to the registers. Um, the, the, and, and the entities that you're involved in potentially could seek tax credits or grants from the state under separate processes that are attenuated and separate from your job here as, which is to provide technical expertise. 
Uh, th now, it gets uh, there on, an, on a case by case basis, you may have concerns about the appearance of impropriety based on a board that you're on or a company that you're working with or a project that you're working on. And those we will we would like to look at, and, and but it's but it's up to you, and and what this what the um, what the standards of conduct are getting at are situations primarily where you would benefit financially from from your position here, and in in most cases I don't see that with with this board. Um, does any, does anybody wanna yeah, does talk anybody about? Does anyone want to propose a, a situation or a question that they have? Well, Kathleen, could you just expand for a moment on impartiality? Mm -hmm. I'll be quite frank to say I'm not impartial on the subject of historic preservation. <laughs> I am partial, <laughs> very decidedly partial. So it, it can't be exactly that that's meant. No, no. It just means that, um, that you will uh, maintain independence of judgment when performing your job so that you will use the expertise that you've had over your long career in state government to determine whether or not a particular, um, a particular proposal should be nominated uh, no, to the right. registers. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask a yes. question. So if there are, this is what I've wrestled with because at my own agency we follow sort of a different approach. So if I'm reading a nomination and I have some sort of personal connection to it, like we, it's in my community or I have, it, I, I'm not financially going to benefit from it being on the register, but I'm, I'm maybe not impartial because I'm championing my, my community. Is that considered a conflict of interest or is that also partially why we have folks on the board who come from different parts of the state? Right. Well, the reason you're on the board is because you have this knowledge and, and experience and you um, can help make that decision. So I would say that if you um, vote on a nomination, you are using your expertise to, to make that decision. Um, the fact that it happens to be in your, you know, it happens to be in a district where you live or is, not, is not relevant to that. Um, that. That's separate and you're not gonna be benefiting personally from that, financially or otherwise. The only way you could is if you owned the building that was being nominated and you were concurrently applying for tax credits. Now, I think we are in the conflict of interest ballpark in, in that hypothetical situation. A and also, if you're uncomfortable and you want to avoid the appearance of impropriety, you want to avoid the appearance of a conflict, even though there may not be a legal conflict, you should recuse yourself from from the the action that you're taking on this board. The problem is we are, we have so few people. We need a quorum for um, decision making. So if there's a way that you could recuse yourself from the other piece out there that is causing the conflict, that that would be more helpful, I think. Um, what, explain what you were telling me before the meeting about how that works. Yourself. Well, if you're on a if you're on a board of a not for profit that's preparing a grant application, uh, I would recuse myself from that. If you know that that's that's one option. Don't don't be involved in that process. Don't vote on that resolution to apply for that grant with that not-for-profit board, you can, you can take actions that will protect you and then your, your decision making is on this board. But again, it's, it's a case by case basis. So if you are uncomfortable with a situation, you should bring it to us. And but Kathleen, if, if, if one of us feels that we have to recuse ourselves from a specific nomination during this meeting, the board doesn't lose a quorum, does it? It does. Yes. It does. It does. It does. It does. You need seven votes. Somebody has to accuse me to not the nomination. Well, unless you have eight people here. Right, no, right, right. No, no, that's right. But you're talking today. It's just right. because we have so few members. I have a question. Can board members who are not currently here vote on nominations? No. 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 no they have to be present they in order to participate and, right. and benefit from the exchanges, I guess. <laughs> we need a quorum for because we need a quorum for attendance as well. So, 
I just um, wanted to, that's just very brief, mm -hmm. and we're gonna get into much more detail this afternoon. Uh, but again, feel free to call us if you have any questions at all, any hesitation, any concerns about potential conflicts. We, you know, and, and because every situation is unique, we, we need the facts and we'll walk you through it. Yeah, if you have a concern, case by case basis, and, I think. Right, and we well. prefer to know about it. All right, now one more item for discussion before we go to presentation-like things from Chuck and the canal folks. And that is the future mean location method. Okay. And David, um, I, I took a poll. Uh, on, and uh, for the two dates of September 5th and September 12th. And for September, t uh, I actually got eight people for each date um, and nine for if Carol is confirmed in time. And I suggest that we stick to the September 5th date because when I took the poll, I did not check with planting fields to see if they were available for the 12th. And I did not check with Bob Mackay to see if he was available for the 12th because I didn't want to get that all stirred up. Right. Um, I, so I have no idea whether Bob is even available on the 12th. I just was throwing that out as a contingency. So since we have eight people and possibly nine for um, September 5th, if that's all right with everyone, um, I suggest we stick with that date even though it is two days after Labor Day. If it's not all right with everyone, uh, we have we do have eight people on September 12th, but they are different people. And Bob They're has, not the same eight people. And Bob has invited us to planting fields on September 5th. Yes. And that is his expectation. Yes, and that is what I when I checked with with the site to see if it was available on the site manager, and they were available. And Chris Flagg, and he was available. I did not check with anybody on the 12th because I did not want to confuse the whole issue. Yeah. I just wanted to see if by chance we did not get the quorum for the 5th if people um, were available. And so the people, just to clarify, I have Wint, Kristen, Erica, Lucy, Doug, Jay, and Wayne. Oh wait, maybe that's only seven, but then Carol. And no Chuck and no Jennifer. Or do I have Kristen twice? You have me twice. I have you twice. <laughs> I take Because I'm so enthusiastic about this one. <laughs> she wants us to come so bad. Barbecue at Kristen's house. One, two, three, four, five, five. Seven. I have seven on the seven. Okay. So we'll be in the same situation, um, possibly, that we're in today. Yes. In at planting fields on September fifth, in terms of numbers. Right. But on the twelfth, we're missing. We're also missing two people, um, and we don't know if the site is is uh, free. Right. Well, and we're hoping, you know. So it just seems to me that we ought to go with the seventh. But everyone who committed. You know, oh, well, actually, I did not hear from Paul. He had to check his calendar and he did not get back to me. So the number um, could improve. The, the number could improve. What, is, what do people think? I think we should go on the fifth. Yeah. Yes. Um, that, you know, our notification deadlines are all set for that, and we would have to change all that. We yeah. stick with the fifth. Uh, so Bob's invited us. Is, he, is this in part to honor him? Uh, he, well, I mean, we've already honored Bob. I think, to me, it seems like the honor is we're going. Mm -hmm. We're going to get the tour of the landscape that he's invited us to. Um, we don't feel we have time to go to the other site. And besides that, Jennifer won't be with us because she's on maternity leave. She's put out numerous feelers to that other owner, and he hasn't responded. And we don't know that we can do the two-day meeting. Right. Um, with the tour of the landscape, it seems that one day on Long Island seems like a good meeting. We'll do the board stuff, we'll have the tour, Chris Flagg will give us the tour of the landscape, and um, that to me seems manageable and doable. Um, you know, especially without Jennifer there. There's no sense in going to that other property if she won't be with us. Um, and she is, you know, I know people want to go to that Vanderbilt site, but Jennifer has put out numerous overtures to that owner and he's never responded. So um, we have a lot of people who really want our help and it yeah. doesn't seem okay. like it's- He doesn't it's know what to do about the place that he's inherited, but it is, I think, National Historic Landmark quality and it, it, it doesn't mean the board needs to go there, but we need to encourage and find ways to encourage him to, 
to do it because eventually it will be sold. And it needs that. Okay. It needs oh, wait. To help. Jennifer won't be with us. She'll be on maternity leave. Yeah, no, I understand that. Yes. Yeah, so I'm just saying that. Yeah. Maybe when she comes off maternity leave, she can. We can help her make an appointment with John to move the A and see if we can move this forward. So and All right, and so also Wit won't be with us on the second date, and so. Um, oh, well. He's one of the main opponents <laughs> of this trip. Yeah, I agree. Um, Lucy won't be with us on the second day, and so it seems. Yeah, the fifth it is. Mm -hmm. Do we okay. need to? No, well, that was our original date. Right, that's so. our original date. We're sticking to it. So it Thank seemed you. like let's say that that's settled. Okay. Um, but no one can back out, or the state police will be. One <laughs> 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 Island Park police will be sent out to get you. Chuck, would you like to provide us an update about regarding the court situation? Sure. Um, I'll be brief, although I do have a PowerPoint available. If, uh, <laughs> uh, this, this, no, it's, 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 it's about 30 slides. You don't want to see it. <laughs> Just maybe, maybe some other time. But, uh, yeah, my report is that regarding the uh, cemetery that was discussed during, at the last board meeting in March. Uh, efforts to recover the human remains associated with that site. Uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, efforts to recover the human remains associated with that site are continuing. Uh, we expect actually to be going into the fall because we're working weekends. Um, the you know, resources available to do this are very limited. Uh, State Museum has been real helpful in terms of continuing those efforts uh, using volunteers and actually some uh, work by or volunteer efforts by professional colleagues and by amateurs from the, the region uh, we're working our way through about 22,000 cubic feet of soil. And at this point, we've recovered just just a little bit less than two dozen individuals. Is this Lake George? Correct. Yeah. Is this Fort, Fort George? It's well, that, that would have been the, that would have been what they called the site, you know, called the areas Fort George. Uh, artifacts associated with these burials indicate that they are uh, American soldiers who uh, died in the hospital at, at, at Fort George in 1776. Mm. These are guys who survived the Quebec campaign. And the retreat south, uh, you know, back to back to Lake George, back to Fort Ticonderoga, uh, and <clears throat> again, it's a big effort, but it needs to get done. This is a situation where a private developer is building something on uh, some kind of piece of land that's extremely important. You're now sitting to the bastard. Correct. Uh, it, it, yeah. To to to, I, I suppose resummarize uh, yeah, what last time. But basically, what happened is is that in February. Um, it was a re report came in that a developer who was constructing an apartment building in the village of Lake George in Warren County uh, had encountered human remains in the excavation of a basement. And <clears throat> state agencies responded, parks, DEC, the State Museum, basically pretty much every archaeologist and state service was there for a couple of days. And we did about a week's worth of work to recover, I think it was 13 graves or parts of 13 graves with about a dozen individuals. It became clear at that point that additional graves had been disturbed and that the remains associated with those graves were in a rather large pile of soil at the other end of the site. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the basement was completely excavated. In fact, the building is now standing and will be finished in the fall, apparently. Um, and again, the effort to, to recover what's in the pile is what we're, we're dealing with right now. Uh, and again, the, the only artifacts we found uh, appear to be our, well, they're, they're odd artifacts from other periods of time, but <clears throat> the ones associated with the remains make it clear that uh, the, uh, the, 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 well, back up a little bit, buttons associated with a unit that only existed from Oct October of 1775 to November of 1776 have been recovered from the site. This clearly associates these remains with the, the Quebec campaign. Nice for us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Just fortuitous that it's that those that particular unit. Okay. Just to pick on that, I was up at the site uh, within the last few weeks, um, and you know the continued intervention, and I appreciate the volunteers, uh, both in uh, state employees and others who are assisting with this. Uh, I mean, there is this extensive. There is a pile of dirt that would fill half this room that needs to be gone through excavated from the from the foundation hole and when I was last up that dirt you know although it is fenced off thanks to additional intervention up there 
that dirt was being used to hold down a basketball uh, court, a uh, net on, on the street to, to wait, you know. Uh, the, you know, the continued uh, irreverence for what this site and material represents is, is quite shocking to me in a community that bases its tourism off of tourism. Tourism that is focused on this period of American history. So uh, this is a project that probably should not have been permitted based on what was known by the village uh, through American Battlefield Protection Survey work that had been done previously in the village. And um, uh, anyway, I, I just appreciate the work that is ongoing to make make better um, a, a really unfortunate situation. Um, so thank you. For that. Yeah, we're we're about 25 percent of the way through the soil at this point, and if you imagine the size, it's 80 dump truck loads of soil. Yeah, so there's 80 dump truck loads of dirt. They've gone through 25 percent of it, and they have found fragmentary remains of nearly 25 individual humans. Yeah, if I had to guess, I would say there's probably more than three dozen will, will be the number in the end. In, in, what, in what you have in Guadalupe? Yes, through. yes. Yeah. There, there are graves that certainly have been completely excavated since the, the, the cellar hole is six and a half feet deep, and the average depth of the, depth of the graves is about five and a half feet. So their entire graves have been pulled completely out. Yeah, it appears that entire graves have been excavated as part of this basement excavation and are in that factory plan. Because what you were able to recover on the fringes of the site were disturbed by that excavation. Correct. Itself. We do not we do not have complete remains for any one individual as yet. Well, Why don't we tell the village that we're considering having our first Revolutionary War celebration on that pile of dirt? Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, uh, well, there, we there expect are, them to be cooperating with us. Uh, there are additional graves on site. I mean, there certainly are. There are graves in the sidewalls of the basement that we were not able to get to. Uh, there are likely graves between the building and the road and in the side lot, you know, associated with that. There is an effort to acquire that, to acquire that side lot, which probably contains at least as many graves as were excavated, you know, in this construction project. Is there an opportunity here to educate the local community that they shouldn't be permitting projects like this? I think that's already local? happened. It's a matter okay. of, it's a matter of the, the, of course, the Lake George only recently hired a professional planner. It's the first professional that they've had in a, in a, in a planning capacity in, that, I, that I'm aware of ever. Uh, he works now for both the village and the town, but he is still dealing with planning boards that are essentially, you know, local politicians. Mm -hmm. So and who still want to do business the way they used to do business and there is as i think uh, daniel alluded to there is um well i'd say a, a, a cultural thing in the area that hu finding human remains is common and uh yeah. it's it's just, uh, what i'd like to say is oh so what you found human remains you know let's move on oh so what that, pardon that's their attitude oh, so uh, i will i will i will say that's that's it's my common. reading it's my reading of it <laughs> Okay. But it is it so is something no one that needs to. The no, no, no. It, it it was not known before. Although uh, certainly remains had been human remains have been found in that area um, for decades before, and and certainly as again Daniel mentioned the American Battlefield report that we completed just last year. That's one of the areas. One of the things we asked the consultant to do was compile information about where barrels had been found or reported in the Lake George area and get them on a map and get what information we could about them. And that was in that report. Although, from what I understand, the decision of the planning board was actually before that, they had that, the, they actually, before they had the draft report. So it really probably wasn't available to them when they made their decision. All right, thank you for that update. It's an unfortunate situation. All right, we're a little ahead of schedule here. Uh, next, I would like to do the uh, report on Matt and Shipyard. Erie Canal Way, folks, is that individual here? Oh, awesome, come on up. Do you have a presentation you want to load up? You're all Andy, set? Uh, did you already load it up? I did, we're off okay. screen right now. There we go. If you folks would introduce yourselves and uh, proceed. Will do, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bob Radliff, I'm the Executive Director of the Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor, and uh, Andy Kitzman is gonna talk to you in a moment about uh, 
our project to preserve and adaptively reuse Matten Shipyard, which is about a half a mile from where we sit. Um, so Andy will talk to you more extensively, but I just want to really just say hello and uh, thank uh, all of you folks and uh, Daniel and Michael and everybody at the State Historic Preservation Office and, and OPRHP for our partnership over the years. Uh, we've had many successes and I just wanted to uh, highlight a couple of them. Uh, and one of them is, if you can grab that plaque, uh, and, uh, about five years ago, I guess it was, working with Kath, uh, we nominated the uh, New York State Barge Canal, 450-mile historic district uh, to be on the state and then ultimately National Register. And then again, working with many folks in this room, uh, just in the nick of time, if you will, December 2016, the Secretary of the Interior uh, uh, approved the National Historic Landmark designation. So as you know, that's a, that's a big deal. And we brought, uh, we had 15 bronze plaques uh, made that are put up across the corridor to recognize this great achievement. And uh, that, that's one of them. So again, thank you for all your efforts and, and partnership there. <clears throat> And I'll uh, we'll never forget, in our office, we still uh, refer to Wint Aldrich's letter, I think, or an email or something he sent to us uh, commending Duncan Hay, who was the author of the nomination, the primary author, uh, on his lucidity and elegance. So we're always uh, commenting and, and giving Duncan props for, for that. Um, I just also want to point out that there's a, a new task force that the governor uh, recently uh, appointed for the canal system. It's called Reimagine the Canals. Uh, it's going to start uh, this month. The task force is going to start meeting. So I just want to encourage all of you to, to pay attention to that. And uh, there's going to be opportunities for, for input. And uh, you know, our organization will be, will be at the table. Um, but just want to make sure everybody stays engaged and that there could be some uh, uh, significant proposals that come out of that, uh, that task force. I also just quickly wanted to thank you again for your partnership. Uh, we're trying to lend a hand to you uh, with the Schoharie Aqueduct, which is also a National Historic Landmark. Uh, Andy, uh, Jean McKay, others have been working with uh, Chris Flagg and uh, folks at Schoharie uh, in the county of Montgomery, et cetera, to uh, look at stabilizing that uh, aqueduct and potentially uh, bring the Empire State Trail through it uh, as, a, as a very innovative way to help stabilize the aqueduct. So some exciting things and, and another great partnership there. Um, so I just want to give you a few updates. Again, I appreciate your time and, and the partnership over the years. And I'm going to turn it over to Andy, who's been the lead on uh, us working with you folks on, on uh, the Matten Shipyard Project, which is a part of People's Island State Park. Andy Kitzman. Oh, also, let me just tell you, too, that uh, we have a guide. We just uh, came out with a guidebook and a, and a map set for the entire canal system. It's a great resource. If any of you are paddlers or know of paddlers, uh, let us know. We'd be happy to give you a copy. Um, I have some. I can go get some right across the street if you want to grab one before you leave. Uh, it's, got, it's a great resource, not only for paddling, but we're finding a lot of people who are interested in the historic resources and other uh, sites. Uh, you know, this guide, guidebook makes references to them, and it's to help people plan their trips and, and visit the, the kind of sites and, and buildings that you're helping to preserve and, and celebrate. So it, it's more than just a, a paddling guidebook, but it is, uh, it is a tool and a resource that you'll be hearing more about. And then we also have this Canalway Challenge program that we just launched. If any of you uh, exercise and get out on the trail, run, walk, bike, paddle, uh, different mileage options, 15, 90, 180, or 360. And uh, it's free, it's easy, sign up. Uh, we'd love to see you out on the trail and there's some of these rack cards available too. So thanks again, here's Andy. Well, as Bob said, thank you for your, uh, your time and, and, and the opportunity to update you on the National Register site of Matt and Shipyard. Uh, so that's what I'm gonna do here. Uh, so, First of all, uh, the dark green section is the Erie Kanawha National Heritage Corridor, and Matten is located right here at People's Island State Park in Waterford, right there, uh, about a quarter of a mile from our offices. It's an easy walk down there. If you do it three times, you get a mile and a half towards the Kanawha Challenge. <laughs> um, and we do do half miles, so it's good. Um, so that's, that's where we are. Uh, it's just very briefly, for those of you who don't know us, 524 linear miles, 230 communities. Uh, and our mission is to work with the, uh, the uh, cultural sites, the municipalities, uh, individuals, universities, alongside that, that corridor. 
And the, the sort of jigsaw puzzle shape there uh, is the external boundary of all of those communities. So that's where we can work. Uh, we were designated in 2000 by an act of Congress and it was in recognition of the significant impact of the Erie Canal on the national story. So uh, we're pleased to have all of you to be a part of this. Uh, so where we are right now, as you all know, is very special. It's a junction uh, of rivers and canals. Uh, the Mohawk coming in uh, from the west to the east, joining the Hudson right here, the Champlain heading north, uh, the, the, the modern barge canal system heading west, uh, just past us right here. And then of course, just out of the pictures, the old Erie Canal uh, that went through the uh, National Historic Landmark Harmony Mills and Cahoes and headed west. Uh, so Matten is right here. And we are sitting in that building right there. So um, it's very close. Uh, normally, because of the size of our corridor, we don't get involved in projects like this where we have to roll up our sleeves and really do a lot of the work, but Matten is close. It's in our backyard. It's part of the, um, the eastern boundary of the National Heritage Corridor, and uh, we like to think of it as the gateway to the National Heritage Corridor on this side of the corridor. So that's where we are. That's some context. Very briefly, one slide of history here. Um, the shipyard was uh, opened in 1917 to take advantage of the New York State Barge Canal, which opened in 1918. Originally, they'd been up three miles north of here on the um, Champlain Canal building wooden canal boats. Uh, then uh, they were in operation until 1983. Uh, they built more than 350 vessels on the site, uh, and they were purchased by the state in 1989. Uh, in that little period between 1983 and 1989, there was a private sandblasting operation on the site. Um, that, that uh, was on the southern portion of the site. And then in 2009, through the efforts of OPRHP, you guys put in the nomination to uh, list, them on the list the site on the National Register. So the map right here, just very briefly, is a 1918 map. Uh, these boxes up here are boats that are being worked on. Uh, there's a couple of buildings that we have today, uh, and I'm kind of at a bad angle here, but um, there's a building here that became extended, and there's the planing mill, which is sort of the signature characteristic building right there. Uh, we're on site then, and the building, the, the site grew up over the years as, as Matten became incredibly successful. They're known, and the nomination was put forward for the steel and wood hull construction. The wood hull happened when it opened in 1917 and during the Second World War. For both wars, they were building wooden hulled vessels, both tug chasers uh, and, um, and mine sweepers. And they were wooden hulled because uh, the mines and, and torpedoes were magnetic residents triggered. So if you're in a wood boat, you don't get blown up, which is huge. Um, in between the... <laughs> More than huge. Uh, in between the war effort, they shifted over to steel hulled construction. Um, and so we have an oil transfer barge here that's on the piers uh, being, being constructed. You can see the cranes that were on site. There was a, a, actually a dedicated rail track right on the shoreline uh, that, uh, that they used all over. And all of the work took place outside. Tugs are sort of the signature piece that came out of here. They're really known for their tugs. There are many still in operation today. Um, this, is, this is one of the last tugs that was being built. As you can see, it's, it's done outside. It's up on these giant wooden piers. And getting them in the water was the trick because they built them on the shore. So they started on those piers. They're above these iron slides that we still have today. They're still in the water. Uh, and what they would do is they would grease these slides uh, about two inches thick with this green, I mean, I'm sure the EPA would have loved this stuff. It was, it was orange, it was thick, it was gooey, uh, and it went right into the river, but they needed it so that it would slide cleanly. The second step, once they had it, had it tied down, each of these piers has a rope that goes up to the boat that holds it in place. This is a staged photo, but it gives you the idea what they're doing. So at each of these posts, there would have been a guy with an ax, and they, the, the trick was to swing in unison and get those ropes all at the same time. Um, then, theoretically, the boat slides down the ramps into the water, huge splash, rocks all the way to the right, rocks back up, 
and then they can put in the motors and everything from there. So that's what was happening at the shipyard. It was brutal work, it was hard work. These were people who worked outside in clapboard buildings year round with no insulation. Uh, great stories and I'll talk about that in a minute. So Erie Canalway decided we really wanna save this place. We think about the future, we think about what is Erie Canalway National Heritage Quarter. We wanna champion the past to, to inspire the, the future generations. So this is a great opportunity for us to do that. So in 2014, we came together um, working with uh, state parks, working with both of our organizations, our, our nonprofit and our commission, the city of Cohoes, uh, and with New York State Canal Corporation, uh, and most recently with Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. Uh, we've developed and completed a feasibility study uh, that sort of guides our work moving forward. And I gotta catch up here with my, we're not launching, there we go. So we have some large project goals. Um, one of the things that we're really aware of, and this was mentioned earlier, is the bicentennial of the Erie Canal. Erie Canalway National Heritage Corridor is looking to work with these partners to develop a legacy project. We see the opportunity here uh, for a statewide legacy project that lives beyond the work that we're doing today uh, to reopen Matton Shipyard. Uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's part of our mission. It's, it's, um, our mission is to preserve the resources, to promote the resources, and to generate economic uh, activity within the communities that we work. So all of those pieces come together here. And finally, um, this is part of Peebles Island State Park, but it's been closed. And so we see a great opportunity here to work with the park directly to make this a valuable part of the experience here at Peebles. It's already a really, really well used facility, the park itself. And adding the Matten Shipyard, adding the opportunities that we could do there um, is great. And I didn't show it earlier, but the Empire State Trail also goes right past it within like 15 feet. So the connections with Empire State Trail are awesome. Uh, we've been active fundraising since 2014. At this point, we have just shy of $800,000 that is primarily for um, uh, pre-development and development activities. Um, at this point, it's most of it is, is, is pre-development, uh, but I'll talk about a few more of those opportunities in just a minute. And it's a mix of, of public and private resources, both federal and state resources. Um, and what I don't have listed on here is some crowdsource funding that we've done as well. Uh, so we've been engaging the community along with our state and, and private partners. Uh, to date, so we've I mentioned the feasibility study. That was a massive undertaking. Uh, we did everything that you would do in a feasibility study, all of the engineering, the archaeology, the architecture, et cetera, to develop a template for what we can do with the site, what's feasible, what's possible, where are the challenges going to lie. Um, we also came out of it with some beautiful drawings, uh, some things that we're thinking about. Uh, a, oops, oops, back here, uh, a kayak launch. Uh, the city of Cahos, one of the first things we said when we approached them, we don't have any public access to the water. This, the city itself, we're, we're in Waterford right here, but the city doesn't have any public access even though they've got all of the water around them. So the opportunity for a kayak launch, somebody just a few minutes ago said, I'd love to be able to store a kayak there. Um, and that's what this potential structure would be, would be a, a, a mesh structure where you could store kayaks permanently. Uh, there's apartments at the end of the block that would be a great opportunity for that. Uh, I mentioned the Empire State Trail right here. So the opportunity to develop some biking opportunities uh, the Day Peckinpah, uh, we've snuck the Day Peckinpah in here. Uh, there's a potential there down the road in the future for the Peckinpah to serve as a floating classroom. The site floods makes it difficult to do year-round programming, but the Peckinpah potentially presents one opportunity there for that. Um, and then the last thing that we've really heard from the public is we want open space. We want a, we want a place to just recreate, and Matton is a terrific spot for that. Uh, in addition to the rest of the park. And of course, there's a little uh, canal boat there. You can see one of the little buoy tenders. Um, and the potential to house um, historic vessels here is, is a great opportunity within the context. They weren't built there, but the context presents itself. So a snapshot of our upcoming activities. The first thing we need to do is make the site safe and clean. It was a shipyard. They were doing all kinds of metal construction, uh, oil, et cetera. Uh, was used on the site. Uh, there's welding rods everywhere. So the next step is to make the site, the site safe and clean. So we've, got, we've tested the buildings. 
We're going to be testing the grounds very soon, and then remediation begins. Uh, and then the other piece of it is shoreline stabilization. Uh, we need to do quite a bit of work on the shoreline. Um, I heard the conversation earlier about the archaeology. Um, this is a significant archaeological site as well. And so we don't want to lose that shoreline and lose the valuable resources that, that are contained there. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're looking at, as well as the pier and other um, resources attributed to Matt and uh, need some work. So we'll be doing the design and engineering for those. We will be going in and doing the, the buildings as well. The buildings need some stabilization. There are a couple of buildings that have to come down. Uh, we just, we can't save them. The engineering is clear on that. Uh, so we do have all the drawings and everything that, that are required uh, to, to, to take those down. So that'll be part of it. So that's gonna keep us busy for the next couple of years. So uh, with that, there's a couple more of our drawings. Uh, just a little vision of kind of how we see the Matten shipyard in the future. And I see I flipped my sign backwards there. That's okay. So at this point, oh yes, please. Um, Bob is passing around a, a brochure that we put together. Uh, it's a little bit of information about what we're up to. And I just want to, at this point, before I take questions, if there are any, I just want to thank um, Michael and Dan and others in the, in, the, in the room here and OPRHP in general. I think I saw Marie uh, back here. Um, everybody who's been involved in this project, OPRHP has really come together with all the different pieces to help us make this thing be great. So my thanks to you, my thanks to Canal Corporation, my thanks to State Museum, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum for all the work and effort that you've put into it uh, over the years. So thank you. I don't have a question. I have an additional bit of information. One of the challenges with this site is it is at the confluence of two rivers. The 100-year floodplain is eight feet above grade. So all the public interest in, oh, it should be a restaurant, it should be this and that, you can't do any of that. Right. Unless you lift all the buildings eight feet out. And there is a photograph from 1936 with a flood that shows the water almost up to the, the eaves of the roofs of these yep. buildings. So it's not apocryphal that it might flood, it does flood. Yep. So what could it be? It could be this. <laughs> <laughs> A shipyard. Um, you know, we've had a lot of conversations. I think uh, one of the things Karen Helmerson uh, from NISCA suggested was there's a great opportunity here for artists and residents. You know, they were doing welding here. So activities, seasonal activities that include the trades, um, tapping into some of the local high schools to do in-service learning projects on the site. There's potential for that. There's potential for wooden boat building classes. Um, there's a fellow across the river in, in, in Lansingburg who does that and has been doing it for with the Troy City School District for 30 years. He'd love to have a place like this to work. Um, and then as a, I'm sorry? Bike and boat rentals, those kind of services? Yep, bike and boat rentals, um, all of these kind of seasonal opportunities um, uh, that, that allow that recreational component uh, within the, the site and, and the space. So um, those are some things that we can do. Um, what we can't do, again, it's, you know, we can't put a wood shop in one of these buildings, although they did years ago. But you know, these, these, these things will flood. So whatever our, our model for the buildings themselves are, they're going to be more of an interpretive space, more of an interpretive element where we're using them uh, in that historical context and then using the space around them as a public space. I think it's a great idea to have the small boat, a wooden boat building, and teaching people to do that. But, but you're saying that because of the floodplain problem that, that they couldn't really have a shop uh, set up for that? Yeah, I, there's the Buffalo Maritime Center, if you've ever been out there, they've got a full, full on boat building, public boat building space in, in Buffalo. It's a great facility. Um, but you know, the equipment that they have in there, um, it would be destroyed in the floodwaters. And these are you know, these big table saws, things like that. So, there's opportunities, though, to do other kinds of hands-on activities that wouldn't require the full-on wood shop or the full-on welding shop, et cetera. Things that are more mobile that we could store potentially here at Peebles or in other locations. Yeah. Um, we did. We didn't do it for very long, though. Um, we did it for about a month, and I think we had about uh, about 40 folks in that time period. But the trick is we didn't put a lot of energy into it either, and that's that's what you have to do. Um, so thank you for asking, though. 
Yeah, so the peck and paw is huge. Uh, right now, it's up in between locks two and three, if you want to see it, right, right here. Um, it's about 260 feet long. It just barely fits in a lock. Um, and the entire interior of the boat is empty. It was, it was used to carry dry concrete. Um, and so it's this giant floating shell is what it is. Um, we have done exhibitions in it before. It's possible. It, I won't sugarcoat it. It needs a lot of work, and there's a lot of energy that would have to go into it to make it feasible. It's yeah. By the State yes. Yes. So the other thing that we did uh, was an oral history project. Um, we, we identified 13 individuals who had worked at Matten as part of their career, mostly their early careers. And those are on our website right now. They're, they're just the transcriptions. We don't have the, the audio um, downloaded yet. But the oral histories are tremendous. They really give you a picture of the life that was happening there and the, the intensity of work that was going on and the year-round experience and the relationship between labor and management um, and, and all of these different components that went into it. Um, and I had a picture of John Matten earlier, and you get a sense of John Matten's temperament and what it must have been like to work on a shipyard with this guy who was really intense um, and successful. Uh, so those are great. Um, they really give that snapshot, and you, you get the sense of smell and the, and the sense of space and, and what it would have been like. So, yeah. I just have one question, Andy. Uh, how did they protect the materials historically from the flooding, like the wood and all? Uh, so right now, uh, they're a little open to the elements. Um, so there's, there's no materials left in the buildings. No, how did they do it historically when they oh, were building ships? How they didn't. They, they let it flood. And then they went in and cleaned it up. Um, and all the guys would show up on the, you know, as soon as the floodwaters went down, they went in, got water out of the rivers, and started sloshing. Um, materials and just, would be hard to use? But, the, but, the mater but they were different. They weren't necessarily working with a lot of electricity. Uh, things that we would have today. So, uh, and then as things got older, they were up. They had other buildings that aren't there anymore, too. Yes? Um, you, you pointed out to me when we toured it, something that, that the light switches and things. Yes. What are they? Yeah. And that's like a great thing to say. Yeah. They're above the highest point of water I've got. Yep. And it's, a, it's very, it's wonderful. Yeah, the light switches are all above your head. So when they did bring electricity in, then, and it has it today, they, they, it was high. And Andy, there are some techniques, right, that we've identified. Yes. If for lift, there's some museums and other places that actually lift stuff up in the event of an anticipated event. Right. Or in these buildings could be designed to basically let the floodwaters go in and out through them to help uh, yep. mitigate the damage, et cetera. So there's some, some techniques to mitigate. There are. Um, a great example of that is the Fairmont Waterworks um, down in Pennsylvania, um, where they have this really high-tech museum exhibition within the waterworks on the Schuylkill River. And they literally, when they know the flooding's coming, they just crank everything up to the ceiling on these, on these pulleys. Uh, it's crazy. Uh, but that's what they do, and they're successful. So other questions? Andy, the, the Hudson River Valley National Heritage Area has created a number of, of classifications for the culturally significant sites and historic sites. And one of the classifications is the corridor of commerce and industry. And there are very few sites that have been identified. This clearly is one. Uh, and, and I would urge, even though it's not going to be open for a while, uh, that you talk to the Greenway uh, about the availability of grants. They're not very large grants, but they, they can be very helpful uh, because we need to beef up the notion that that uh, green as our valley is, it's always been important uh, as an avenue of commerce and uh, a site of, of industry like this. Uh. On the Hudson Valley National Heritage Area, Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Mr. Chairman, just to, to note for the record, um, you know, Bob, Andy, thank you for your presentation and, and for the partnership uh, that exists in many forms between State Preservation Office and the Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor. I just want to note for the record that uh, Michael Lynch and I both, uh, because our spouses, uh, our respective spouses, both work uh, in some capacity for the Erie Canal Way National Heritage Corridor. We are officially recused from any decision making regarding uh, the Matten Shipyard Project, grant reviews, et cetera. Uh, and I just want to note that for the record. Uh, it's, it's other staff that really have picked up this project here at SHPO and Phil Griffiths, uh, who we see occasionally on the fourth floor, 
uh, works for the commissioner, a special assistant to the commissioner. This is his project at the executive staff level. It doesn't mean that you don't love it, though, right? <laughs> I do love it, yes. <laughs> the conflict of interest threat. Okay. All right, I think we're going to move on. I've asked it twice a day, so I keep my eye on that. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to National Register reviews. Pretty much on schedule here. Bill, are you going to start us off? I have four proposals uh, for your consideration. Uh, we will range through a, uh, a wide range of themes from art to lead mining to murder to, uh, well, we'll just get into it. And I want to begin with uh, Asgard Farm in the Sable Forks area of Essex County. Uh, being nominated in the areas of art, agriculture, and agriculture, with a period of significance from 1927 until 1971. Asgard Farm was the home studio and farm of the noted American artist Rockwell Kent from 1927 until his death in 1971. The building's landscape and other features that constitute the nominated property largely fall within two definable periods. The first, the Kent occupancy period, spans from the late 1920s until the artist's death. The principal features of the farm dating to that time include Kent's circa 1928 studio, which we see in the lower left, and the various agricultural buildings erected for his farm and a commercial dairy operated under his auspices. The Kent era agricultural buildings centering on the main dairy complex and wood stave silos appear frequently in Kent's painted depictions of the farm, as do the general environs. And for uh, example, in the upper left, uh, the painting Cloud Shadows, which shows the, 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 the ag complex uh, right at the uh, center. The, cent the second distinct period dates to the more recent times and represents the post-Kent era. It includes new agricultural buildings erected to sustain contemporary agrarian and commercial functions in addition to a frame dwelling that replaced the one built by Ken, Kent following the destruction by fire of his original house, uh, Gladsheim, and that is something that occurred very uh, near the end of his lifetime. The nominated property also includes a small three-grave cemetery in which Kent is interred, a frame cottage that Kent erected in the mid-1930s as housing for his son, Rocky, which is now known as the Emerson Cottage, and a number of secondary resources. The farm is set amidst the dramatic natural scenery of the Adirondack High Peaks, and I think you get a sense of that uh, in both the painting and the lower right image, which serve as a compelling backdrop for the farm's more immediate pastoral setting. Although Kent's original Asgard farm dwelling, along with the simpler ranch-type house that was erected to replace it, no longer remain, the remaining historic resources, among them the barns and the studio, nevertheless substantially portray his residency and illustrate the artist's various interests and the activities undertaken there during his occupancy. The nomination boundary includes approximately 226 acres of associated land, 11 contributing Kent era, and five non-contributing resources. Asgard Farm is significant for its direct and lasting associations with the life and work of Rockwell Kent, a major American artist of the 20th century. It was the home, studio, and working farm of the artist from the later 20s until his death, and it contains the small cemetery in which he is buried. Uh, Kent, as you probably either know or came to understand from the documentation, was a polarizing and controversial figure, and I think that might even be an understatement. Um, given the nature of his various political and social stances, um, he was nevertheless a prolific artist and traveler, and for over four decades, the farm served as his principal residence and base of operations. The Adirondack Farm served, uh, it served as a, a, a source of creative inspiration, seemingly endless, and both the farm and the immediate setting were, were portrayed in any number of works. Among them, this is my own, Asgard's Meadows, Asgard in January, Asgard Farm, and Cloud Shadows, which you saw on the first slide. 
Uh, he purchased it, purchased it with his second wife. Uh, he himself, uh, recounting the event in his autobiography, said, I wanted level, for, uh, level land for farming, mountains to look at, and the quiet of a countryside that had not been invaded by summer colonists. One day we came upon the place, the next day we bought it. In spite of the fact that Kent's dwelling, Gladsheim, along with the simpler ranch-type house he erected to replace it, no longer remain, the farm nevertheless retains any number of character-defining features that date to his occupancy, principal among them his art studio, which is in a relatively pristine state, and of course the agricultural buildings. Uh, the farm thus retains not only significant physical vestiges of the artist's long-standing occupancy, but also a distinct sense of place, as demonstrated in salient connections that remain between the existing farm and the outlying landscape and Kent's own paintings. It was Kent's home studio and farm for nearly 45 years, and as such, it is of considerable, considerable importance to his life and artistic legacy. Actually, I went forward too quickly. Uh, so here we see basically the, the agricultural uh, uh, core of the farm. Of course, one of the, 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 the documentation spoke to the fact that he was operating a very successful uh, commercial dairy in the 1940s, but his political support of Wallace basically undermined this and created a huge stir and basically his milk was boycotted and it forced him to basically close and, and, and transfer the business to someone else, which um, he was very bitter about, uh, understandably. Uh, some interior views of the studio, and as I say, as though he, uh, he could have walked out just the day before I was there. A lot of his personal effects and artistic uh, materials are still there, and the space really is virtually unchanged from, from his usage. And finally, some of the sighted views, and you get the sense of you know, site specificity. We see this with some artists, not all artists. Uh, we can think of Frederick Church and you know, the center of the world and how important you know, that landscape was to him. But here, there's obviously a very deep connection with the remaining place and, uh, and the setting, and as I say, a very strong sense of place. Of course, uh, he was interred there, and just briefly, uh, that is his own painting of the Gladsheim house, which burned about two years before his death and was replaced uh, by a ranch house, which is eventually replaced by this modern house uh, built by the present owners, and that is the Emerson Cottage, which now serves uh, as a rental property within this wonderful farm that really makes phenomenal cheese. Uh, we have a letter of uh, support from the owners, David Brunner and, and Rhonda Butler, who I would say have been outstanding stewards of this resource and understand uh, its, its significance and have gone to lengths to even just recently repair the wood stave silos. And that is uh, Asgard Farm. Please, question. Uh, um, well, I was going to say it's really clear, really solid nomination. So thank you for being so detailed. I thought handling the, ch the complications of his life was very well done. Um, and also the real significance of this the landscape to his work, which brings me to my question. What's the level of significance? Because it seems yeah, national to me, but it's not we, marked. Yeah, we, it's another one where I think Kath and I started saying, well, is this truly nationally you know, significant? Is it statewide? If anything, it's, 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 it's probably approaching national significance. I mean, to my mind, given the, the, the you know, Kent, you know, the major demerit is the loss of the original dwelling, which for, in this process, we thought with everything that was there, you know, it, 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 that was, you know, palatable, especially with the studio and the landscape. Um, certainly something we can broach. Uh, Kath, do you have any? We could. Um, I guess the idea of putting him as an artist into a national context and being sure that's what you that, would that would be enough, that's kind of the only thing that really stopped us. Mm -hmm. So at the um, moment, and the is loss it, of the house. But, but I think the loss of the house, to me, the key to this nomination is the landscape and the mm -hmm. representation of the landscape mm -hmm. in the paintings, which I think is spectacularly. Yeah, it's nice to see so many examples of that site True. in yeah. that context. And there is another the site artwork. associated with him on the register. Yeah, his, uh, his, uh, his, art, his studio on Monhegan Island where he, he sort of made a name for himself. He spent maybe a four year period and he went back there later. He actually repurchased it, I believe, and lived there for a series of summers. Too, a yeah, this, this one more comprehensively deals with a, a longer period of his life and the mature, really, phase. Yeah. Not that, that that work was certainly important, the early work, but, um, you know, Just his Just making sure lot we had the argument for national. Um, yeah, I, I agree. Discuss it. Yeah. So is it statewide right now, then? It's statewide. Probably statewide okay. right now. Okay. Yeah. It seems yeah. worth considering. Um, we will explore it. Yes, absolutely. 
Do I hear a motion? Lucy and Chuck. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. I right, to venture into Kath's territory for this one. <laughs> I'm actually embarrassed. It's a one time in my career where I was told, you've been to this place, and I said, no, I haven't. And then Kath said, here's your field notes. <laughs> said, I guess I've been here. And you would think I would remember this one, so it's, it's an anomaly. In any event, the Hasbrook Stone House, located in the hamlet of Hasbrook in Sullivan County, being nominated in the areas of architecture, social history, politics and government, and explore, exploration settlement. Um, the Hasbrook Stone House is a large rubble stone building consisting of two distinct but connected sections, a two-story main block and an attached story and a half wing, both gable roofed. The building, as currently constituted in large measure, reflects the original circa 1815 building campaign, although it evolved and was aggrandized with the frame addition by the 1870s and was expanded again near the turn of the 20th century. Those post-1815 frame features, the last of which was erected in association with the house's operation as a seasonal boarding house, were removed by the 1970s. The main block was erected above a rectangular plan with a center hall, two-room deep configuration. Although alterations have been made to the spatial configuration, the original plan remains fully interpretable. Many original finishes also remain, among them molded wood trim of a characteristic federal style type, and the house's original open stringer staircase, which rises from the first floor hallway through the, uh, through the second story to attic uh, level, and which includes tiger maple turnings. Although modifications have been made during the course of its history, and although the later frame additions have been removed, the nominated house nevertheless remains an excellent specimen of the early 19th century stone house type and one that portrays the convergence of a long-standing regional vernacular building tradition with distinctive formal elements of the federal style. And just to touch upon that, it's, 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 it's strange this building sort of had this whole other life and you know, by the uh, 1970s, the, the, the features, uh, the additions that spoke to those uh, you know, periods um, we're gone, so we're basically, we, we've gone back to the original build in some ways. Um, so a little bit odd in that, that regard. Uh, the Hasbrook Stone House shares salient associations with the early history and settlement to the Fallsburg area of Sullivan County and one of its most tragic 19th century events. It was constructed for the family of Anthony Hasbrook, a member of one of the region's preeminent and early settling families. Anthony Hasbrook was described in a later 19th century account as one of the most prominent citizens of Sullivan County and among the wealthiest, and thus the house formed a conspicuous, conspicuous indicator of his stature in regional affairs. Sadly, it was in the nominated house that Anthony Hasbrook was savagely murdered in 1840 by Cornelius Hardenberg, the horrific climax of a feud that centered on issues of local land ownership and inheritance. Ironically, Hardenberg's grandfather, Gross Hardenberg, had himself been murdered in 1808 at a time of considerable agitation in the area due to disputed land titles. For his premeditated murder of Hasbrook, Cornelius Hardenberg earned the ignominious fate of being the first person convicted and sentenced to death by hanging in Sullivan County's history. Hasbrook's murder at the hands of Hardenburg deprived Sullivan County of one of its most influential citizens and leaders. Some photos of that really wonderful staircase. Uh, the nominated house documents the continuation of a long-standing tradition of regional stone masonry construction dating to the early 18th century and its convergence with design features characteristic of the federal style, the dominant architectural mode of the first quarter of the 19th century. Here we have wonderful pictures of the staircase, uh, the remaining uh, front transom of wood laminate construction, as well as uh, a photo of one of the front parlors. Uh, so obviously a building of architectural interest, but uh, embedded in that uh, narrative is this, this, this horrific event that occurred in 1840. As they say, this was the simmering resentments uh, um, that Hardenberg had towards Hasbrook 
um, due to issues of um, inheritance and land title, but um, an interesting, uh, not an uplifting story, but an interesting one nevertheless. And that is the Hasbrook Stone House. See, there's no fireplaces in there, and that's one of the things. Um, the house may well have been built for stoves. Um, usually in an early 19th con century construct, you've had a clear indication of a hearth support with a cradle to support the hearthstone, and there, there was no evidence even in the framing for that. So it may well have been built for airtight stoves. You're getting into that period where that's becoming more common, but still would seem somewhat early for that sort of thing, but there just wasn't a lot of physical evidence to, to work with. Catalyst for the nomination is the Concerned Citizens of Hasbrook. Uh, Kath, can you speak further? I, it has sort of fallen through the cracks for a few years. We have taken care of it. We hope. Well, we should wait for the vote. <laughs> No, but these buildings sometimes would be lime washed. They'd have a coat of lime wash, some of the stone houses. You'd see that. There's one view, the boarding house picture. It looks almost as though it had been stuccoed because it has a very smooth, you know, face on that north elevation. But um, it's possible. Well, there's one image that shows um, one of the later, the boarding house image, makes it look as though it could have been stuccoed. But I thought as we look through the masonry carefully, I didn't see a lot of evidence for, you know, a thick stucco. If anything, it might have just been a wash, a lime wash coat over the stone. Uh, this is very similar to the Hull House in Erie County. Same age, same house type. The Hull House has a chim uh, fireplace in every room. It was stuccoed for a time, and then they took the stucco, stucco off. off. If that was the case, there will be archaeological evidence of repairs to that over the decades uh, in the dirt around, in the, the, around the yeah. that's a place to look. Um, but yeah, this is an interesting building. Now, I also noticed some unhewn logs in the uh, attic area that would be possible candidates for dendro For dendro, enough. yeah, it would be nice to have a firm date. It's just, it's another one of those sort of vernacular anomalies. You think because of the stature of the people who built it, you'd have a fair sense of exactly, you know, when yeah. it was built and completed, and we just, we don't. Yeah, you, you know, might we think be able 1810s to is. That. It's interesting that this is in Sullivan County. Not a lot of stone houses survive in, in Sullivan County. They're usually across the border in Ulster. There are tons of them. This is really just over the border, and um, most of them in Sullivan County don't survive. Well, I thought the most interesting thing is even in like the 1840s or something, like a quarter of the town's population still were living in log houses. 1855. Or, yeah, 25 55. That's right. 55. That's right. Log homes. Yeah, that's yeah. Amazing. So it gives you a sense of you know it was still in a sort of semi pioneer state yeah. even at that late late date. Interesting. Do I hear a motion? Kristen, second by Wint. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstained? Okay, we're good there. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Uh, moving on to uh, the Bigelow Finch Fowler Farm, the house known as the Century in West Lebanon, Columbia County, being nominated in the areas of architecture and communications with a period of significance from circa 1830 to 1937. In a nutshell, this nomination seemed like a sort of a straightforward architectural nomination, farmstead. And then we started to find all this compelling history about the gentleman on the left, Warren Fowler, uh, who was instrumental in establishing uh, telegraphy service and ultimately telephone service in the Lebanon Valley, being operated, as the picture shows, basically out of the house for a time. So um, the communications element of this nomination is as compelling as any other aspect of it. Uh, the central feature of the Bigelow Finch Fowler Farm is the brick dwelling known familiarly as the Century, which was erected circa 1830 for the Bigelow family. It is a gable-roofed building of brick and sawn marble construction consisting of a two-story main block with symmetrical five-bay facade and center hall plan and a contemporaneous rear brick L with two small frame uh, extensions, extensions added in more recent times. It's actually a, a, a domestic topology, not that unlike the stone house we were just looking at in terms of its, its form. The exterior of the dwelling largely conveys a late federal style aesthetic. 
as expressed in its principal cornice in the original segmentally arched doorway, which we see survives, but with the later Italianate doors uh, inserted into them. Additional details, such as the double leaf glazed and paneled entrance doors in the projecting bay window, speak to a subsequent 19th century Italianate style updating. In addition, some later period historic features, among them hardwood strip flooring and a pressed metal ceiling are also to be found. Original circa 1830 features include brick fireplaces with marble dressings and wood mantelpieces, paneled wood doors, and the principal staircase, among other noteworthy features. Uh, there's also a number of barns, a small barn complex, and all these features survive on a roughly 17-acre parcel. A good look at the house. Actually, if you make your way up and down uh, Route 20 or east or west, however it goes, you'll, there, there are some houses that are conspicuous along the route. This one's sort of tucked back. It's right on the road, but it's well screened by, um, by trees, so you can't even really, uh, as you see from my presentation, get a good shot of the, the facade. Uh, the Bigelow Finch Fowler Farm enjoys both architectural and historical significance. The associated property was first settled in the later years of the 18th century by the New England pioneer Jabiz Bigelow, whose family's presence accounted for the West Lebanon area being known historically by the name Bigelow Flats or Bigelow Hollow. The current house was likely erected for Jabiz Bigelow's son, Gail Bigelow, and thus it represents their settlement and tenancy of the nominated property. The house and farm was later owned by members of the Sherman family, which had intermarried with the Bigelows during the 19th century, and yet later by the Finch and Fowler families. In 1873, Mary Jane Finch, a daughter of then owners Edwin and Mary Ann Finch, wed Warren Fowler of Manchester, Vermont, a union that initiated a new epoch in the property's history, and, then, and one that had important repercussions for the larger region. Fowler, a ins uh, successful insurance agent, was an advocate of telegraph communications, the potential of which he viewed as transformative for those residing in the Lebanon Valley. During the ensuing decades, Fowler played a central role in the establishment of telegraph service in the region, and ultimately telephone service, technological advances that changed the complexion of life in southeastern Rensselaer and northern Columbia County in the period. Those operations were established and conducted for a time from the nominated house, thereby providing an additional layer of significance to the property. I, I love the description by the historian of the family. You know, they're, they're baking in the kitchen and the phone rings and they clean their hands. Say, this is central, and they put the call through and then they just go back to what they were doing. It's a really interesting a portal into the early history of, of telephone services. Really rather interesting. And just a few uh, views of the barns on the building as well, although this really was not so much a, a nomination about agriculture. Uh, by really the later 19th century, it seems this was being sort of functioning as more a gentleman's farm than, than anything. And that is the Bigelow Finch Fowler Farm. Thank you. Now we'll move on to my last proposal for the day, and that is the Ancrumdale Historic District, located in the town of Ancrum, Columbia County, being nominated in the areas of architecture and commerce, with a period of significance from circa 1795 to 1952. Uh, we have a total of 26 contributing and 11 non-contributing properties, I think a total of 18 owners. Um, I will speak to uh, the support and objection situation at the end of my presentation, but I'd like to just go through and, and uh, just give you the background first. Uh, the Ancrumdale Historic District corresponds with the unincorporated hamlet of Ancrumdale, which is situated in the southeastern portion of the town of Ancrum. A majority of the architectural resources that are included within the district boundary are located in or immediately around the hamlet's core. Just by way of uh, introduction, um, really uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century there, there wasn't really a hamlet here. It's really the discovery of ore, of lead and silver ore that leads to the settlement and, and population of this place and its development as a small commercial center. So we see it was called Hot Ground first, then Ancrum Lead Mines. Hot Ground is one of the great historic names. It's hard to top <laughs> that one. 
And then really we'll see here is our district area just centering on this, the, the intersection of these roads and uh, Punch Brook. Ancrumdale's initial development dates to the first years of the 19th century at which time mining enterprises were first established there. Wood frame 19th and early 20th century buildings of vernacular characteristics are the predominant building type within the district, along with a number of modest commercial buildings. It additionally includes a historic church complex consisting of a Greek revival style meeting house, parsonage and parish house, in addition to architectural resources that relate to the town's rich agricultural history. Here we have some representative dwellings, uh, the likely uh, earliest dwelling, possibly the Kiever House, late 18th century, and just a sense of sort of the modesty of these buildings. Um, really, I think the prevailing architectural sentiment was one of uh, somewhat restrained, if you will. Um, this was a modest place and people of modest means, so the architecture is in many ways, uh, as I say, pretty simple and straightforward. Originally contained within the bounds of Livingston Manor, which at one time embraced a large portion of present-day Columbia County, Ancrumdale grew in association with local mining endeavors and on account of its agricultural interests, which were bolstered by the arrival of the railroad. At the dawn of the 19th century, the hamlet was a little more, more than a sparsely populated location within the town, but during the second and third quarters of that century, it experienced a period of perceptible growth. Most of the domestic architecture within the district exhibits a conspicuous modesty of scale and ornamentation that conveys the social and economic background of the community during the historic period. Although the district is composed in large measure of vernacular buildings, there are nevertheless recognizable expressions of prevailing architectural idioms, among them the Greek Revival style and modest expressions of picturesque and late Victorian era architecture are also present as are some early 20th century buildings. Uh, this is the Farmer's Wife, which is one of the businesses uh, that serves Ancrumdale now. This is it as a, a historic store, probably later 19th, early 20th century, Barton and Holzreut. And uh, this is great. This is in a Renault uh, advertisement for Le Car. <laughs> so I thought that was really wonderful that it served as the backdrop uh, in this 70s, I think 1976 uh, advertisement. Ancrumdale today remains a rural crossroads hamlet characterized by a collection of modest vernacular buildings that collectively portray the growth of this locale from the turn of the 19th into the early 20th century period. We have a letter of support from the town of Ancrum. Um, this has been part of their comprehensive plan since 2010. Um, they came to us with three districts following cultural resource survey work by Ruth Pawanka. We listed the hamlet of Ancrumdale maybe two years ago, and this is the second of three districts um, that they will, would like us to consider. The third one is Boston Corners, what was called the Boston Corner, which has its own interesting history. It's actually part of Massachusetts into the 1850s till Massachusetts decided it couldn't really enforce law or anything there because it was on the other side of the Taconic Mountains, so it was annexed uh, to New York State. Uh, we unfortunately have a letter of objection. It is from uh, Gary and Janet Deach, who I've had considerable uh, conversations with um, since our public meeting over a year ago. Uh, they are the owners of likely the earliest house, which is here, and this is one contiguous parcel here, and also the lead mine property. Um, they are staunchly against the proposal, I would say that. Um, I have done my best to navigate the process and listen to all voices, but at this time it is the only objection uh, that we have. Um, I'd also like to introduce some special guests who have made the trek up here, and I don't know, uh, Roy and Judy, if you came up from Brooklyn or Ancrumdale, uh, but Roy and Judy Sloan, who have been advocates for the district for a number of years and supporters. And I don't know if you guys would like to say a word or... It's an honor to be here. Um, we're just journeymen. Um, my husband and I have dedicated our lives really to restoring the places where we've lived. And we do live in Ancrumdale. 
and in a house, by the way, that has no central heating, it has electricity, it has water, it has a stove, <laughs> that's how we get our heat. But um, we have seen close up the value of preservation because we see people come through our town just to see these buildings. And there is an economic, very small, but it's an economic incentive. The people who run the farmer's wife have done a beautiful job. The, the hotel, that yellow house on the corner, um, has been kind of, it has been restored, but it's also now used as sort of a little bed and breakfast. This is very small, a small E on the economy, but something that's so valuable. And we have, as I say, spent our lives just preserving our little house, our little Greek with the little eyebrow windows, in the st and live literally in the style of that was intended. We have, we have, we lime our interior walls because when we leave it um, seasonally, of uh, you know, we we turn off the water, and so we have to make sure that the you know the the plaster doesn't fall off. So I mean, we do everything that's trying to preserve it in our very small way. But I just want to say, um, on behalf of my husband and I. Um, Bill has been wonderful. He has been a wonderful advocate for the work you do. He is uh, very modest and very um, smart and just very um, enjoining of our community. And everyone, with the exception of this one couple, and it's, it's a personal thing for them, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense, um, maybe because the water is not tainted, but of course we're always afraid that it could be, <laughs> so we do get it tested a lot. Um, there is no lead in, in, in Ancrum uh, water system at this point. But um, it is just very small town pettiness, and we just hope that you will sort of um, embrace Bill and, and all the work he's done here, and we are very grateful for your consideration. Thank you. That's embarrassing. <laughs> I do like to thank you and especially Bill um, and invite you all to come and visit Ancrum, the ha hamlet of Ancrum Dale, to see what an incredible, intact little market town it is and how much it preserves the, uh, the feeling of the 19th century town. Um, you know, perhaps the reason it was called hot ground might have had something to do with uh, uh, the personality of the people who lived in the area. So we want to preserve that too. And uh, I hope you'll agree to support the designation. It is so worthy of it. Um, uh, I really strongly invite you all to visit. Thank you. Yeah, he has a fair amount of acreage and I actually, um, I, I, I set this aside for a while. You know, my concern was creating divisiveness in the community and having this, you know, be a, a potential negative. But also got to the point where there were a lot of people for it and the town was pushing for it as well. But yeah, that's a substantial, uh, there's no question it's a substantial parcel. And while it might not be the way I see the world, I certainly respect people's um, ability to object if they don't care for the process. The problem is, as I explained it, they said, well, cut us out. I say, we, we can't, you know, we cut it out. We don't have a district. It's the lead mine. It's the earliest house. You know, we, we lose our district. It's, it's, it's either all or nothing, really. So it's just one of those, I say, unfortunate situations. Um, Part of my question relates yeah. to possible changes to the National Register yeah, that could. Uh, process. And mm -hmm. is that in play here? I don't think it's in play here at this time. No. No. But, but you can imagine a situation in the future this is precisely yeah. the situation this that we sort of This is precisely the around. kind of situation. Um, just outline that parcel again. It wouldn't be the majority, but say that person also owned the big parcel immediately to the north there, um, or that per person to the north did object, then that conceivably could stop the nomination. Daniel, can you remind us of what the new criteria could be? Um, there's been a proposal advanced by senior administrators in the National Park Service, Department of Interior, actually at the DOI, probably not really out of the NPS, um, that the, uh, in a, in a propose, for a proposed district such as this, where currently every property owner uh, has the ability to support or object to a nomination, uh, and therefore your total count, your majority is based on the number of property owners. There's been a proposal that that shift uh, for the National Register Program to a calculation that gives um, uh, sort of a weighted vote 
based on the amount of acreage you own within the proposed district. And so a larger landowner would have a higher, um, uh, higher value. Their vote would have a call, you know, come with a higher value uh, under that scenario. Um, the public response to that proposal, uh, the deadline has passed. It was overwhelmingly uh, against uh, proposed changes. Uh, the National Park Service is processing and responding to that public comment. We are not expecting a report back uh, with any immediacy. I mean, the, the volume of objections was significant. Uh, the uh, volume of uh, support was diminutive, uh, probably five or six letters in support out of uh, total public response of over 3,000 uh, public comments. Uh, so uh, anyway, the committee, you know, the process will not have concluded, will, will not be concluding anytime soon, and a number of members of Congress um, have begun weighing in also an objection. So we'll set that aside. In this instance, even under proposed new rules, uh, the district would probably be uh, acceptable to to advance. But uh, you begin to see the calculation, how the calculation shifts, and how the dynamics shift in this type of district nomination. We do also have very long, strong letters of support from the town, isn't that correct? Well, that's correct. Yeah, the town, um, as I say, is happy to see this happen and has been behind us. And I've, I had a long talk with the town supervisor just to say, you know, we have an objecting party. I just want to make sure that, you know, the town is comfortable and we're not, as I say, creating division in the community. That's my main concern. Do I hear a motion to approve? Uh, Went? Second? Second. Erica? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Well, thanks to All right, shifting Sorry. to Powers Building and Powers Hotel. Do I have the order right? I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, with the Powers Building and the Powers Hotel in, in Rochester and Monroe County, um, every once in a while, we, that is the SHPO, get an opportunity to do something a little out of the ordinary. And in this case, uh, this is one. Uh, back in 1968, the Powers Building, seen in the postcard on the left, was documented by HABS, which led to the city of Rochester locally landmarking the building in 1971 and a listing on the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. Daniel Powers, seen on the right, was one of those uh, Rochester movers and shakers, um, important in the development and, shall we say, updating of the historic Four Corners city in the city, which was a site that dates back to early settlement period and one that became a center of government and civic, uh, government and commerce, okay? Very important site. Uh, as noted in the draft you received, both Habs and the original nomination neglected to mention Powers' importance, nor document that he was the owner of the former hotel connected to the Powers building on the west. The opportunity arose to amend the documentation when the current owner of both buildings wanted to do a tax credit project with the former hotel and found out that it wasn't listed. Uh, just to point out, Here's the hotel. Here's the Powers Building. There's the hotel. The left image shows both the Powers Building and the Powers Hotel. And just to quickly recap, the Powers Building was the design of prominent Rochester architect A.J. Warner. Construction began in 1865 with the final expansion completed in 1890. The building was advertised as fireproof, being constructed of cast iron, brick, and limestone. It was also a multi-purpose building with a law library, since many of the, uh, the uh, offices were rented to lawyers, and an art gallery, which quickly became an important gathering place for the community. In 1973, the building was listed for architecture only. Now we fast forward to today, the boundary is being amended to include the adjacent Powers Hotel, add Criterion 8 in the, in the area of commerce, and provide important information on Powers and the architects of both the building and the hotel. Of vital importance is adding the Powers Hotel to the nomination, especially since the hotel and adjacent building were historically interconnected from the hotel's construction in 1882. 
Okay. Um, the map in the upper right is a Sanborn insurance map from 1892 that clearly shows the connector. The upper left image shows the hotel as it appears today. The nomination notes the various changes in updating to the building, so I don't need to go into that here. Now, it's hard to see, but there's the connector still visible on over Pendle Alley, um, although it's now used as office space. The lower images show the lobby after a renovation around 1940 and what it currently looks like at present. Some of the columns and part of the vaulted ceiling are still visible. The nomination details extant historic fabric after various changes and updates. Okay. Now for the slightly complex part. In documenting the building, the consultants discovered that the Powers Building was connected by a 1990 walkway to a large city-owned parking garage north of the Powers Building and Powers Hotel. And the parking garage is seen in the lower left. Um, the walkway is seen in the upper right. Below that image is a view of Pindle Alley and the historic connector between the hotel and the Powers Building. Now, according to the National Park Service, technically the connected buildings must be part of the new boundary. And we were instructed to enter the resource as one listed building, the Powers Building, one contributing building, the Powers Hotel, one non-contributing building, the 1989 Sister Cities Garage, and one non-contributing structure, the 1990 Skybridge. I think the consultants who drafted the, am the amendment did a stellar job while working through all the confusion and nuances to adequately document that this important historic resource in the city of Rochester. And I'd like to introduce to you one of the consultants, Gina DeBella, who worked with Sarah Linda Hooker to do justice to this resource. And Gina, have I forgotten anything? Would you like to add anything about your experience on this? It's up to you. <laughs> okay, all right. So, and it's great too when we get these old nominations that have very little documentation um, to have the opportunity to provide the, the information. And as Sarah Linda Hooker pointed out, after she looked through the HAPS documentation, even that was lacking. So, hopefully, we've corrected all of that. Virginia, could you go back to the first photograph, first uh, slide? Uh, I draw your attention to the fact that this appears to be a photograph of our deputy commissioner photoshopped <laughs> with, a, with, a, with a chin whisker. I'll work on that one. <laughs> wow, did not see wow. that. Wow, it's on the record. Though. Yeah, that's <laughs> video and audio. Yeah. Yeah, this is a nice job of cleaning up an old form. The old form was in 1973. Has the bar changed that much for? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Y yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. Sort of left out the Powers Hotel, um, but we did try to leave out the garage because it's such a tenuous connection with that little bridge that actually goes over another building. Um, they wouldn't let us, and then the way they asked us to count it was really kind of bizarre. But we went along with it. <laughs> yeah, I even responded in my email going, now, really, this is what you mean? And she yeah, said, yes. Um, it's a tax credit, and we're happy to do it. And I, I have to compliment the, um, the writers of the nomination for really explaining it in a very clear, understandable way and getting all that history down yes. that we didn't know about. So uh, Virginia and I were both very pleased with this nomination. Yes. Yeah, good project. Yeah, it showed in the review as well. Motion to accept. So move Wayne and seconded by Chuck. All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Code of Vista Historic District in Greece next? Yes. And I have to mention that Gina's involved in this one too. Okay. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, and just a little background on this project in Monroe County. The idea for the historic district began with the Coda Vista Community Association with support from Gina, who at that time was the town historian. In 2015, Gina invited me to meet with members of the association, and I was struck with the historic architecture and cohesion 
what the National Park Service defines as feeling and association um, within the neighborhood. The community association lobbied the town to apply to the Preservation League and NISCA for a survey grant, which became the basis for this nomination. Uh, we're looking at the southeast end of Ayer Street near the center of the district, and you can see the reminder of Kodak to the south. The nominated district is significant under Criterion A in the area of community planning, and it contains 371 contributing buildings and only 13 non-contributing buildings, 10 of which are garages. And that just attests to the integrity of this historic district. The district is clearly eligible under Criterion C for its collection of modest middle-class housing representing popular styles from the 1920s through the 1950s, with a handful of earlier structures being remnants of the town's earlier agrarian period. The building in the upper right is one of the oldest, dating from circa 1890. Uh, it's a nice Queen Anne building that was believed converted to a funeral home during the period of significance. And that period of significance runs from circa 1890 to 1960. The building is, uh, the district is basically the union of three subdivisions. Elmgard, which opened around 1918. The Kodak Employees Realty Corporation, roughly from 1921 through 1942, and the Hoover Vista section, which I can't show you because these two maps are from 1924, and the, code of, uh, the Hoover Vista section um, was a post-World War II in final phase of development. Okay. Um, the lower right map show the lower right, actually, the photograph that's here. This shows Elmwood, or Elmgard Street looking toward West Ridge Road. And the lower left map shows the property just south of the nominated district and why the Kodak Employees Realty Corporation developed the streets to the north. Like I said, both of these are 1924 maps, but this was on page 34 and this was on page 36. Most of the streets were opened by the Kodak Employees Realty Corporation with financing through the Eastman Savings and Loan Association, another company, Perk. Most of the houses were built by local builder George Long, who provided the house plans, hence the cohesive appearance. The realty company was able to keep the cost of construction between roughly six to seven and a half thousand dollars through the purchase of land and bulk uh, materials. The houses from the KERC development in the older Elmgard subdivision are mostly modest Tudor, Craftsman, and Colonial Revival designs. The final phase of neighborhood expansion occurred on the West End mostly after World War II. Prior to the war, Willis Britton opened Hoover Drive and donated land for a school that was named in his honor. And as more families moved into the neighborhood, the school expanded as well and was later renamed the Hoover Drive School. And it's now operated as a charter school. Um, and you can, I really couldn't get a, a good view of showing, you know, from street level. So I resorted to the aerial view to give you a better view of just how large the school expanded. Um, another relator uh, by the name of William Henderson was largely responsible for building houses on Hoover and Vista Drives after buying lots in 1948 and 1949. And Vista Drive is seen in the lower image. In 1952, the three subdivisions of Elmgard, Kodak Employee Realty, and uh, Hoover Vista Drives became part of the Coda Vista Neighborhood Association now known as the Cota Vista Community Association. Um, the, the, and they are the sponsor of the district nomination. The association was originally formed in 1928 with the dual purpose of providing socialization for the residents and looking out for the needs of the neighborhood, one of being lighting. Um, the association had a hand in selecting the design of the street lights. You can see one of them here. Um, to date, we, re we, we have received only one letter of objection indicating a strong support for the district by the residents and the continued information campaign by the association for this project. And I should mention that letter of objection is from a daycare center, which is on the opposite side of the Hoover School. Okay. 
You wanted to make some comments, Gina? Okay. I just wanted to say that I'm really very happy to be here today and honored as well. I thank you for um, for um, the powers of nomination and, and approving that. And as far as the Cota Vista Historic District, I'm I'm really glad to be here to hear you ex hear you. Hopefully, you'll accept it. But um, in the town of Greece, um, I'm thankful to Virginia and Kath for for taking this on because it. It, um, there's been some struggles along the way. Um, the, the, this whole nomination actually started about four years ago with, with a, um, uh, a grant that I, that I wrote through the Historic Preservation Commission for, um, as a Preserve New York grant to get a historic resource survey done. And if, um, if this is approved, this will actually be the first historic district in the town of Greece. And I think that it could, it, I'm hopeful that it'll become a model and an incentive um, for other historic areas in our town. Um, some of you may, may or may not know that our um, town leaders don't exactly support historic preservation as they did away with our Historic Preservation Commission, but hopefully this will just give them some proof that, you know, it's, it's not too bad to have a historic district in town, and, and I really hope that um, the neighbors, the, the residents of the town, of, I mean of the district, um, will benefit hopefully from historic tax credits because this is in one of the, one of the um, census tracts. And we do have, I think, all but two of our census tracts in Greece um, are qualifying census tracts. So hopefully we can move on to some other areas as well. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for taking the time to come to the meeting and your willingness to speak. Cota Vista, questions, comments? Do I hear a motion? Kristen? Erica will second. Erica? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. That was great. All right. Uh, Montgomery County is outside of my territory, so I ask you to bear with me on this one. Um, this is the, sorry, Doug. I, I jumped in before you yeah, introduced. I just want to thank yeah. Virginia for doing this because it was one that she inherited from Emily, and she was gracious enough to take it on and put a lot of work into it. So I just wanted to. Which is why it's out of my comfort zone because I don't know Montgomery County. <laughs> I know the Finger Lakes, that I know well. Anyway, um, but it, it does give me an opportunity to learn a little bit of the tiny history of an area of New York State I don't already know about. Okay. Well, anyway, Palatine Bridge, the historic district. Um, the Palatine Bridge Historic District is significant under Criterion C for its architecture and Criterion um, A for transportation largely due to the railroad helping to lessen the village's isolation and then later the automobile. With new bridge replacements, the village pretty much became the, a bedroom community for Canajahari across the river, since that's where most of the jobs were located. Um, early in its post-Revolutionary War history, a bridge connected the two, and the bridge continues to be a major artery. Now that, um, that's how you get to the on-ramp and the off-ramp of the New York State Thruway. It's on the Canajahari side, okay? The current bridge was constructed after the period of significance, which is uh, 1739 to 1966, and is therefore not included in this nomination. And I wanted to show you the aerial view. This, here's Palatine Bridge up here, if you're not familiar with the area, and here's Canajahari. The village is a sponsor for the nomination, which is the result of a Preservation League NISCO funded survey. And I need to mention that the nomination draft you received included a map with a slightly different east boundary. The boundary pictured here is the correct one and shows a, a um, significant degree of integrity with the non-contributing resources outlined in green and one large individually listed property, the Fry House or Frey House, I'm not entirely sure. If it's German, it's Frey. Okay. Um, this is the boundary that I will ask you to consider and to approve. Okay. 
Uh, furthermore, we need to address the elephant in the room, or rather the elephant in the district. The nominated district had two previously listed now demolished properties. The one pictured in the upper right is the Palatine Bridge Freight House that was listed in 1973 and demolished around 1980. The property was made into a municipal park, and the surviving historic feature is the Gothic structure containing the water fountain scene in the upper left. The other listed building was the Webster Wagner House, also listed in 1973 and demolished in 2016. Um, we, that is the SHPO, elected to keep the site within the nominated district should there be archaeology issues, and the building seen behind the empty lawn, I should point that out, uh, that's here. Um, there's some local lore that it might be associated with the Wagner House, but additional research needs to verify this presumption. Okay. Um, if you're interested, well, I should go back one, a couple. You can just see there's a pile of sticks over here somewhere. There it is. There's the uh, Webster Wagner House under demolition. Anyhow, let's get to the, the district. Okay. Palatine Bridge initially formed along the Mohawk Trail, now State Route 5, or in the village, uh, it's known as East and West Grand Street, and later along Lafayette Street, also known as SR10. Now, if you keep traveling north along SR10, you hit the thriving metropolis of the hamlet of Stone Arabia. If you keep going east along Grand Street, you'll eventually encounter the village of Fonda. And both Fonda and Kanajahari have both have recently uh, na listed National Register Historic Districts. Okay. Um, the Palatine Bridge settlement at first was tied to agriculture until the railroad came through in the mid-19th century. And the images here show parts of the north side of West Grand Street, and you can see the variety of ages and styles of architecture showing the growth of the community. The early 20th, in the early 20th century, well, actually, this is the, uh, the south side of West Grand Street, and the upper right shows the circa 1900 limestone schoolhouse. Okay. That served the local school population for a half century before consolidating with the Canajahari schools across the river. It's now being used as an office building. And in the early 20th century, Route 5, or Grand Street, became part of the Mohawk Turnpike. Two contributing properties survived from that area, era, one being a seven-bay brick garage auto repair shop just east of the bridge, and the other a gas station, I should point that out, right here, okay. Um, the, the historic buildings in Palatine Bridge were featured in an automobile guidebook, such as the historic Fright Fray, which was uh, pictured in a 1924 guidebook, and here's the guidebook. So just to prove that I'm not making this up. The nomination includes a nice narrative describing the village gradually becoming a bedroom community for Canajahari, especially after the opening of the Imperial Packing Company around 1910. We now know that as Beechnut. And unfortunately, um, Beechnut is very quickly disappearing. Last time I drove through it, I saw this gray cloud as they were knocking down part of the beach nut plant. Okay. Seen here um, is the lower end of Lafayette Street, which shows that despite being one of the older streets in the village, residential development began in earnest in the early 20th century. Okay. And the same can be said for Center Street, seen here. Center Street was one of the offshoots. One of the last streets to open was Carmen Court, a post-World War II section with a handful of mid-20th century Cape Cod homes. The end of Carmen Court features one of two cemeteries included in the district, this one being an early settlement era, bur era bur burial ground with some headstones with German inscriptions. A total of 211 contributing buildings are in the district with roughly 90% of them being residences. Even with the loss of the Webster Wagner House and the Freight House, the streets and accompanying buildings in the nominated district are little changed since built, and non-historic infill is limited to directly across from the bridge. 
The intact resources underscore the themes of settlement, transportation, and architecture that create a thread throughout the period of significance. Now, questions and comments about Palatine Bridge? Uh, I remember the Wagner House. I remember admiring it as I drove by on Route 5. It may have been some years ago. Uh, I'll grant you it needed some attention. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that I hadn't realized that it was already listed on the register. And the freight house probably is from the 1840s. It's the earliest railroad that went west, uh, that far west in New York State. Uh, who was it who was saying okay to this demolition? These were both on the register. I mean, was the community not concerned about it? Uh, uh, that I, I don't know, but uh, I do know that the village that uh, was the sponsor of the nomination looked at what was happening with the Webster Wagner House and wanted to see, okay, what else is in our village? What are we overlooking? What are we missing? Exactly. So it was one of the things that did spur this particular nomination. Well, glad to hear that. It I, just I, came too late and, to and, save and the and Webster Wagner House. As are, are recall, they, when do they come off the register? I mean, if they Well, gone. I think, as I recall, um, from Emily, uh, someone let us know that w the Webster Wagner House was in ownership of some person for years and years and years, and it just kept deteriorating. Yeah. You know, it was like some private owner, you know, it wasn't in public ownership, right. and it just kept deteriorating until either it began to fall down yeah. or the village demolished yeah. it for whatever reason. Yeah. It just one of those things, you know, it was. No attention was paid to it for many years until somebody said, oh, look at the pictures. This is falling down. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the other one. Um, that could uh, easily have been stable. House. That was demolished many years ago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, around 18, 1980. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's a privately owned building, the Webster Wagner House was listed many years ago. Yeah. It's no really sad. If you Google so. images of the Webster Wagner House, yeah. you can actually see the deterioration. Yeah. It's, it's pretty sad. And at that sad. point, we can't just step in and send somebody out to preserve it. Um, I know. It now, seems to me the freight house, you could make a strong argument. I mean, I, if it's 1980, you know, there are a few of us are still off, alive. But, uh, we can take things off if people ask us to. And it involves... Um, preparing a little bit of documentation. We don't have to bring it to the board. We have to send notification letters to the owner and the chief elected official, and then sending them to Washington. Um, a lot of states routinely clean up their NR lists by taking things off all the time. You'll see on the weekly list, you know, like Kansas, removal, 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 removal. It's just enough work that we just sort of let it, and who knows that there might not be archeology span on the site of the, of the Webster Wagner yeah. House. It's just enough work that um, if we spent our time routinely doing that, we would have less time to develop to new projects. So we've never made it a priority. When somebody has asked us to, yeah. we have done it. And if okay. the board thinks it's a priority, we can devote more time to it. No, I'm not suggesting uh, that. Just, just I find it irksome, especially looking at that freight house. I mean, that's that could easily have been recycled in some interesting way. Um, I think it's a big win, though, that the village looked at this and decided then to do a survey and make all of the property owners um, eligible for homeowners tax credits, yeah. rather yeah. than just say, oh, another one gone. Yeah. Let's just forget about it. So something good came out of it. Yeah, that is the good thing. I have two comments after the vote. Yeah. I'll oh, wait for the vote. Uh, do I hear a motion for the district? Well, well, well having grumbled. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Motion carries. So, so two comments. And Virginia, if you could go back to the very first slide, the aerial view. Of. Um, first of all, I, I do think um, uh, we are making significant progress in the Mohawk Valley. I mean, this, this board, in, re, in just in my two years here, has listed a number of districts uh, in the Mohawk Valley that do begin to attach the resources with the incentives, and of course, that's significant progress. Um, just a quick update on, on Beech Nut, since it was referenced. The Beech Nut facility is in the lower right-hand side of this, uh, of this slide. Um, 
there is obviously the Erie Canal, Mohawk River uh, to the north, and then there's a creek uh, that intercepts, bisects the BeachNet uh, facility uh, to the lower right as well. Um, everything to the, to the east, to the right of that creek, is post-1940 construction at the BeachNet facility. Um, and uh, through, um, or right now, the BeachNet property is owned by the county of Mon Montgomery County. It was acquired through tax foreclosure. It's about $2 million in unpaid taxes on the property uh, from an owner subsequent to BeachNut. Um, and uh, the county is engaged in an active visioning process for redevelopment of that site. We have, uh, we, uh, our compliance unit um, has taken a very hard look uh, at redevelopment plans with Montgomery County. Uh, we have authorized uh, demolition of all the facilities to the east of the creek. And so the, mo the second round of that demolition activity is what has been visible over the last two months as you travel uh, the throughway corridor. And so the site is really effectively cleared um, to that creek boundary. Uh, and we're having, you know, the focal point for discussions now is what's happening on the west side. There have been proposals for additional clearance um, on the west side, that's the historic core of the complex. Uh, we have uh, Julian Adams and um, uh, Weston Davies and, and other staff here have been involved in a very detailed discussion with Montgomery County about the threshold between compliance review and tax credit review, and that at a certain point, uh, early plans, uh, aggressive plans to demolish additional components of the of the of the project would take them out of the opportunity to use the rehabilitation tax credit at the federal and state level. So the discussion right now is focused on the west side of the creek, what needs to be preserved to remain eligible for tax credit access. Um, there is additional remediation that is, has been funded by New York State. It is not going to involve demolition on the west side at this point in time. It's going to be interior abatement, asbestos, mold, other issues there. So. Uh, the discussion continues. Uh, it is probably the most visible redevelopment project on the entire throughway corridor, uh, at least in eastern and central New York. Uh, a lot of eyes are on it, and I just want to assure you that our office is very engaged uh, with Montgomery County in evaluating the opportunities uh, to take, take that site forward. Also to also draw you to draw the area, area, the area the art museum, museum has the full, the full Great exhibits, museum. exhibits so with summer and, and, and winter green parties there, there, which, there. Is, which is fun, fun, fun. fun. Arkles right Arkles there, right there, yeah. There, yeah. All right, so uh, the Fultonville Historic District is significant under Criterion A in the areas of transportation, settlement, community development uh, for its role as a significant Mohawk Valley commercial center during the 19th and 20th centuries. The district is additionally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture for its collection of residential and commercial buildings reflecting the community's prosperity during the historic period. Uh, and I wanted to start with this map just to give you that little bit of context because there's a, a few things going on that sort of make Fultonville what it is. Um, the Mohawk River here and this road are very early pieces uh, to what makes Fultonville happen. Um, this is now the throughway, but that was the original canal corridor, the railroad corridor, um, and then sort of the throughway layered on top of it. So it, it feels like it's this interruption in, in the village, but it's this pattern, this layering of transportation. The settlement and growth of Fultonville is directly related to its location along natural and man-made transportation routes, which enabled it to transition and flourish from river and road to canal and rail. The community was settled at the intersection of an early north-south road and bridge crossing of the Mohawk River. When the Erie Canal was completed through the village, this multimodal transportation network made the village a particularly important stop. 
The settlement thrived and the village was chartered in 1848. The construction of the West Shore Railroad in 1883 along the south bank of the canal and the 1919 opening of the Barge Canal on the Mohawk River both served as important boosts to the village's transportation-focused economy. And the commercial buildings on Main Street really reflect that late 19th century growth. Um, and then, of course, we have this remaining uh, freight depot, which you can see from the throughway when you're passing through. Um, it doesn't have a use right now, but it's right there next to our Empire Trail, so maybe, maybe someday. South of the village, Main Street climbs up the hillside. The Van Epps farmstead, located at the height of land, forms its southern border and reflects the continuing importance of agriculture into the second half of the 19th century and the value that the canal brought to it. The densely packed village features a combination of more high-style residential buildings from various periods of the village's growth on its more prominent avenues, um, as well as many modest uh, examples of residential architecture throughout the village. Um, and a lot of these are located directly on the former canal route and serve as this really uh, vivid uh, group reflecting the, vivid, the built landscape that served canal workers. Um, this building in particular is still an apartment building of some sort and it was almost certainly a boarding house for canal workers uh, right there in, in the village. A few more resources on the southern side of the village. We have the uh, rural cemetery in the Starin Mansion. Uh, John Starin was the village's primary industrialist and benefactor, and he established his large summer home on the hill during the late 19th century. Starin's silk mill operated into the 20th century and inspired the creation of a number of smaller silk and glove making operations throughout the village. And while the construction of the throughway um, in the, over the canal route in circa 1955 marks the end of the period of significance, and that did result in some loss to the village, but overall uh, that layering resulted in um, the preservation in large part of the village's historic plan and its architecture. So the draft uh, was by Jesse Ravage, our uh, very capable consultant out there in the Mohawk Valley uh, and the survey in the National Register nomination for this project was supported by a Preservation Preserve New York NISCA grant. And that is Fultonville. Uh, onward to my, my typical territory here. Uh, this is the Dorrance Brook, Dorrance Brook Square Historic District. The Dorrance Brook Square Historic District is significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as an example of a late 19th century Harlem neighborhood distinguished with richly detailed row house architecture, churches, and apartment buildings. Between 1886 and 1904, the four largest blocks in the eight block district rapidly took form as a residential enclave with 12 rows of private houses designed by 10 different architects for eight speculative developers. The blocks reflect the transition away from Queen Anne and Romanesque styles to lighter and more restrained Renaissance revival styles. And the early residents of the neighborhood were upper, upper middle class merchants and professionals and well off immigrants. Over speculation and an economic downturn effectively halted development in the area until 1913 when conditions favored the construction of apartments for commuters. The five earliest apartments are more modestly designed, and the last, constructed in 1930, features Art Deco flourishes and was intended for black residents of means, reflecting the changes in the district's population and Harlem's generally to an almost entirely black one. And that last apartment building was named after Dorrance Brooks. The district is also significant under Criterion A in the areas of social and ethnic history for its associations with a number of significant people and institutions of the Harlem Renaissance, when extraordinary artistic and intellectual output by black writers, artists, performers, sociologists, civil rights activists, and others brought Harlem global recognition. 
Prominent figures who called the district home during this time included W.E.B. Du Bois, Walter White, Regina Anderson Andrews, Ethel Ray Nance, Jules Bledsoe, and Alelia Walker. Uh, the neighborhood was also home to Dr. May Edward Chin, the first female doctor in Harlem, Augusta Savage, Georgette Harvey, and Shirley Chisholm. The district's four churches, uh, particularly St. Mark's Methodist and Grace Congregational, played an important role in fostering the community's artistic, intellectual, and civic development. And perhaps most fascinating uh, of all of these layers of significance in the neighborhood is its significance under Criterion A in the area of politics and government as an important gathering place within Harlem's black community. Uh, this is Dorrance Brooks Square itself, uh, which was dedicated in 1925. And it's the first public space in New York City to honor a black serviceman. Uh, Dorrance he died in action while serving in a segregated military regiment during the First World War. The square's symbolic association with Brooks made it a frequent site of protests, marches, commemorations, and political rallies. On two occasions, in 1948 and 1952, President Harry Truman delivered campaign speeches there before massive, predominantly black audiences. Both times, he detailed his administration's work to advance civil rights policies, including desegregating the U.S. Armed Forces. And his 1948 visit was the first time a sitting U.S. president had come to Harlem to speak to black constituents. And that is the Dorrance Brook Square Historic District. Uh, the draft was by uh, consultant Marissa Marvelli. And we have letters of support from 40 property owners and New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Any questions about the district? It was great to read about this district. And the context was really important. I also, like in a minor, but for me important thing, I really appreciated the detailed explanations of the photos. The, because sometimes I'm going back and forth, and so I, I really appreciated the historic images, the contemporary images, and the text. But some of my photos repeated, was that intentional? I'd have like to I, look at it, oh, okay. probably not. So there's, it oh. seems like every image is small with the text, which is great, and then a full page, because then I, so I, I realize what you're talking about. So typically I add the photos on at the end as a separate PDF and combine them. Um, I'd forgotten that Marissa had put in the photos with got her it. descriptions right below them. So you guys got a double dose of photos on this one. <laughs> um, but that's not the worst thing in the world. No, no it's, it's minor. <laughs> it's just, at first I was Yeah, I'll, I'll tidy that up a little bit when yeah. you send it to the Park Service. Thanks. Doris Brook Square, Historic District. Do I hear enough uh, motion? Sorry. Kristen? Second, all in favor? Aye. Kristen first? Either way. Either way. Whatever you like. We both support it. Okay. Opposed or abstain? Thank you. Um, onward to the 32nd Police Precinct Station House Complex, also in Harlem. It's significant under Criterion A in the area of government and politics for its association with the growth and development of the New York City Police Department as it evolved into a professional city bureaucracy. It's also significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture um, for its collection of buildings reflecting the changing nature of police station design in New York City between the 1870s and the 1920s. While New York City's creation of a police department in 1845 made it the first American city with, full, with a full-time professional force, it remained small and underfunded in its early decades. Until the early 1860s, most station houses were rented and inadequate to meet the needs of officers. In 1862, the Metropolitan Police Board appointed Nathaniel D. Bush the architect for the department. In that role, he was responsible for designing a significant number of new station houses and altering older ones to meet contemporary needs. The 32nd Police Precinct Complex was built to his design in 1871-1872. The station house and attached prison is a fine example of post-Civil War civic architecture in the French Second Empire style and retains its integrity to a high degree. The design reflects the creation of a professional identity and image for the police force and the pride that the city took in building small-scale civic buildings in city neighborhoods where they came to symbolize the importance of the city and residents' lives. Bush's plan for the station house reflected the practical needs of the department and the public. 
Uh, as officers were on duty for a long period of time, the station house needed to include public spaces and office spaces, which you see here in the front, uh, as well as sleeping quarters, uh, which were primarily on the upper levels of the building. And then you see back here is the, the modest prison um, we have a few interior shots. The building uh, has been used since the 1980s um, by a religious organization that's based community-based nonprofits out of it. Um, but th the integrity seems to be pretty good there. And here is the, the prison building on the back of the, the, the building. And adjoining it is the garage, which funnily enough is what drove this project not the beautiful precinct house. Uh, the garage was built in 1925 to 26 and replaced an earlier stable on the same site. Its more utilitarian design marks a change in civic architecture uh, toward a simpler, more economical strategy. And this building also provided efficient, purpose-designed space for a police force that was increasingly reliant on automobiles. So this garage is going to be the focus of a historic tax credit project. I'm not exactly sure what it's going to be. Um, it would be interesting if it stayed a garage, but I doubt it. Um, is it? Yeah. See, there we go. There's the answer. Uh, so we do have an approved part one on this project and a letter of support from the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Thank you. Uh, onward to Brooklyn. Brooklyn uh, for the Fourth Avenue Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, which is significant under criterion C in the area of architecture as a good example of the Akron Combination Church as designed by its originator, George W. Kramer. It's additionally significant under criterion A in the area of social history for its association with the growth and development of the congregation and the surrounding community of Sunset Park. The congregation was originally established as a mission of Brooklyn's 18th Street Church during the 1870s, and it grew alongside the surrounding neighborhood after the introduction of new transportation improvements between 1889 and 1893. Hundreds of speculative row houses were built in the new neighborhood of Sunset Park by 1900. In response to its growing needs, the congregation purchased this site in 1885, constructed a parsonage in 1890, and built this church in 1893-94. The congregation hired the firm of Weary and Kramer, which was nationally known for its church designs. Kramer used the, commonly used the Romanesque revival style as he did here, uh, to create a unified design that suited the larger scale buildings typical of his combination church plans. Kramer's Akron combination church plan consisted of a semicircular arrangement of Sunday school classrooms connected to an auditorium style church sanctuary with a movable partition. This plan provided the dual benefit of providing space for group and individual instruction in Sunday schools which were growing in importance and creating overflow seating capacity for the sanctuary during periods of high attendance or special occasions. So here's the sanctuary looking toward the doors there on the left. Uh, and here is the view of the doors from the Sunday school side. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful condition and shape here. Completed as the neighborhood developed rapidly around it, the attractive church immediately began to serve as a social and cultural neighborhood anchor. The congregation had about 300 members when the building was completed and reached a high of nearly 3,000 during the mid 20th century. And that is the Fourth Avenue Church. Uh, the draft was completed by William Marash for the sacred sites. And we do have a letter of support from New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission on this one as well. It's amazing to me that Kramer is reportedly built over 2,000 churches yeah. or, or buildings. Basically, he figured out one thing and he just replicated he just it, did it everywhere. So. And not just here, like all over the world. Yeah. yeah interesting. <laughs> Other questions or comments about Fourth Ave Metropolis? A motion. Erica was first there. I'm going to say Lucy. All in favor? Aye. Opposed or abstain? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
All right. Uh, all the way out to the tip of Long Island, we're going to East Marion. The East Marion Main Road Historic District is significant under Criterion A in the areas of settlement, commerce, and social history for its association with the establishment and growth of the hamlet of East Marion in the town of Southold. It is additionally significant under Criterion C for its collection of architectural resources reflecting the founding settlement population, the growth of the community's year-round population, and its economic means into the 19th century, and the gradual influx of seasonal residents into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The district reflects its organic development along Main Road, the primary road on the North Fork of Long Island. During most of the period of significance, circa 1757 to 1953, virtually every household in East Marion was supported by fishing, farming, or a combination of the two. Initially settled during the 17th century, East Marion remained lightly populated due to its remote setting and was further disrupted during the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812 when the British were in Gardner's Bay, uh, right next door. The earliest surviving buildings are simple post and beam dwellings sited close to Main Road. And these are some of the finer, more lovely examples of early buildings in the community. And both of these have elaborate doorways um, done by Eamon Tabor II, a local carpenter. The completion of a wharf and the Long Island Railroad and neighboring Greenport in 1827 and 1844, respectively, created new employment opportunities and connected the remote community to distant markets. Farmers began to specialize in market crops, fishermen enlarged their businesses, and the region opened to tourism. These new economic advantages are directly reflected in East Marion's built environment. Many simple homes were updated and expanded, and new homes were constructed to reflect their owner's success. Newly wealthy sea captains tended to construct larger Italianate and Victorian homes set slightly further back from the road. East Marion's church and chapel reflect the community's vibrancy during this period. The community had a strong chapter of the Sons of Temperance, hosted revivals, and held civic and social meetings in these community spaces. I will note, as you probably noticed in the nomination, for all their strong uh, temperance organization. This was also a major area during prohibition for rum runners. There's a great anecdote about a little girl being told to duck down when they're seeing the Coast Guard lights and bullets are flying. Uh, so she didn't get caught in the crossfire while in her bedroom. Early 20th century buildings on Main Road include classic revival homes, summer estates set far back from the road, modest cottages, and catalog houses from the Sears Roebuck and Gordon Van Tyne companies. So there's a real diversity of types of buildings, uh, especially when you're looking at the difference between the summer and the year-round community. The completion of the East Marion Memorial Post Office and new fire station in the mid 20th century, both of which are located at the core of the community physically and socially, represent the last significant change in the community's operation and appearance. Uh, and this post office is a bit of an interesting story with it being constructed in 1947, um, sort of out of the desire for a need for a post office and the desire to do something about having a World War II memorial. Um, they repeat, and I haven't been able to find any evidence to refute them, that it's the only World War II memorial post office in existence um, in the US. So uh, there's another little funny special thing about East Marion. So the, the nomination was sponsored by the East Marion Community Association. Uh, the draft was co-written by three members of the community, Ruth Ann Bramson, William Clayton, and Robert Harper. Uh, we have letters of support from the Oyster Pond Historical Society and three owners, and we do have letters of objection from nine owners, uh, just a small contingent. And that is the East Marion Historic uh, District. Similar, um, I think the biggest concern uh, is a small group of people um, who don't like the fact that the vote is being counted by objections rather than everyone has to vote yes. You, uh, the way that uh, we count objections is people have to object. If you do not object, your vote is automatically, your vote mm -hmm. is automatically counted as in support of the district. Uh, and they. They had, they had problem with those regulations. That is how it is, and I didn't make them, so. 
To be clear, those are National Park Service requirements. Yeah. 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 Yes. But their objections aren't they don't want their property. It's, it's they don't like the procedures. They're not crazy about the district, and they don't like the procedure. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's talk about, the, is that your last one? I have one more, but finish we can. Your, finish your last one. <laughs> I'm feeling myself flagging. <laughs> can I just say rushing? Okay. Uh, we'll get this one done, and then we'll, we'll talk. So this one is a, a little complicated and interesting. Um, hopefully you managed to sift your way through this nomination. So there's multiple layers of significance going on with this property associated with the Wagner residence and St. Patrick's. Uh, so here is St. Patrick's, the church. Here is the Wagner residence. Uh, this is a non-contributing building built later by the church. Um, and these have all been associated with each other at different periods of time on this two and a half acre property. Um, and as I go forward, we'll tease them out a little bit. So the Frederick and Annie Wagner residence is nationally significant under criterion B in the area of transportation for its association with Frederick J. Wagner of national and international auto racing fame. Wagner started his career in newspaper and magazine publishing with an early focus on bicycle and automobile racing. After nearly a decade of work as an editor, promoter, and publisher of magazines, including Bearings, Cycle Age, and Motor Age, he began writing for the New York Times and House Beautiful. In addition, Wagner rose to prominence through his work as an automobile racing's most well-known starter. Uh, as the American Automobile Association's sanctioned starter, he was involved in numerous prominent races, including the Vanderbilt Cup, the Indianapolis 500, the early Ormond Daytona races, and many others. He was bouncing all over the country. Uh, and this is a very famous photograph of Wagner uh, right here in 1906, at the Vanderbilt Cup, which is the very first use of the checkered flag uh, to signal the end of the race. So he's associated with this very important moment. <laughs> The house, constructed in 1912 as the seat of Wagner's Sunnybrook Farm, is significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture for its design by Gustav Stickley and its method of construction. The Wagner residence is one of a handful of buildings known to be directly designed by Stickley himself and one of only 221 house plans published in The Craftsman. The house was constructed using the Van Gilder system, a yet to be patented system of cost effective monolithic hollow wall cr concrete construction. And you see it in process here, uh, which is also a little bit special to get to see one of these buildings as it's going up. After the completion of the project, Van Gilder became an important adverti advertiser and partner for Stickley. Stickley provided the Wagners with a first floor plan similar to what he designed for his own home in Syracuse, which is considered his first craftsman style interior. Uh, the plan and interior detailing are largely intact, if a bit worse for wear. The building hasn't been used much by the church uh, in the last couple decades, and we'll come back around to that. Um, but the, the building is surprisingly intact on the interior. While in Smithtown, Wagner continued to write for national publications, work in different aspects of the automobile industry, and traveled to start prominent races across the country. From 1911 to 1922, Wagner held annual outings at Sunnybrook Farm that brought famous racers and auto industry leaders from Broadway and across the United States. The farm provided Wagner and the auto industry a venue for networking and camaraderie. Wagner sold Sunnybrook Farm in 1923 and retired to California. The farm was sub subdivided nearly immediately and was largely the focus of new suburban residential development, as you would expect uh, on Long Island during that period. St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church, now the Byzantine Catholic Church of the Resurrection, is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture for its Tudor revival design by architects McGill and Hamlin, and under Criterion A in the area of social history for its association with the growth of the congregation. When St. Patrick's was established as Smithtown's first Catholic church in 1835, the Catholic community was located outside of the hamlet. After the church was destroyed by fire in 1927, the congregation chose to move to the center of Smithtown. 
they commissioned McGill and Hamlin to design a new church building on land very close to that, that Sunnybrook farmhouse. Uh, and the building was completed in 1929. So the move of the congregation to the, the center of Smithtown, as well as the ability to hire well-known architects for what remained a mission church, really reflected the congregation's growth, uh, greater acceptance within the community, and new associations with wealthy suburban congregants. Um, and these details you see on the beams, um, as we'll come to see on the interior, th that was never executed. It only existed in drawings. Uh, so here we are coming in the entrance, beautiful brickwork, and in the sanctuary, uh, which largely retains all of its features. As the Byzantine church, it does have a new iconostasis, uh, as you see there. And some details of the stained glass windows, which McGill was very closely associated in the design of. So over the next 20 years, the congregation grew significantly, allowing it to become its own parish finally in 1952, after over 100 years of existence, which is remarkable. That year, St. Patrick's acquired the former Wagner residence as its rectory, uniting the two resources on the two and a half acre parcel that exists today. Uh, all of that being once part of uh, the Sunnybrook Farm. St. Patrick's moved to a new building in 1967 and sold the property to the Byzantine Catholic Church of the Resurrection soon after. Um, and while the rectory uh, Wagner House has fallen into disuse in recent decades, the congregation has gotten really excited about this recent rediscovery, discovery of this connection with Wagner and Stickley, uh, and they're working to raise funds to restore the building and once again use it as a rectory uh, for the parish. So the draft was written by Corey Geske, a um, local independent historian, and is a grant candidate. I, I hadn't realized that Talbot Hamlin had been an architect. I mean, yeah. you sort of know the name as a biographer and mm -hmm. architectural historian. The entire staff had exactly the same name. Yeah. <laughs> there must be a different Talbot Hamlin, right? <laughs> Wagner just being such an important figure during that period yeah. and um, as such an, a prominent writer he's been called and, and referenced as like an early historian of automobile racing um, just was from Corey was a very enthusiastic researcher <laughs> well the stickly connection alone would, would mm -hmm. make it uh, a great distinction Hi. Thank you. All right, so we're in a bit of a time crunch here. Uh, what about an okay, what's your idea? What if Jen and I go through our. You've all read the nominations. Right? Yeah. As always. What if Jen and I just kind of go through our slides fairly quickly and you vote on them? Okay, I just. Well, I, or want, do you have I want an idea? to. Well, I, my idea is eat lunch because I'm starving. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm about to pass up. All right, we can do that too. We can get our lunch. What if we take a five-minute break, bring our lunch back? You can take the time to give us good presentations okay. as you always do. Do we still have time to do the training it's, if we start after? If we one start at two, I think, I think there are time constraints. Um, people have to leave. Wayne has to leave at three o'clock. Well, drop dead time. Yeah, as does you, Lucy. I So we have two people that are out the door it's about at three. A 90 minute. Can we do it? Uh, I think so. Um, Andy Dunn is here. He's going to be doing it primarily with me. So we'll go check with him. Yeah, while we're eating. Yeah, take five, get your lunch, then we'll do the nominations. Jen, I apologize. All right. So I'm going to go all over the state. <laughs> Literally. I'm also thanking um, Jen. She took. Um, Two of Emily's pro two of these are Emily's projects. So thank you, Jen. And thank you for dealing with us eating lobster. That's all right. <laughs> So the James H. Case III and Laura Rockefeller Case House, located in Van Hornsville, Herkimer County, is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as an excellent representative example of a mid-20th century modern-style summer house complex. The Case House is also... Sorry. 
The Case House is also notable as the first large commission by architect Willis N. Mills, Jr. It was built for the cases in 1962-63 and recognized by architectural record in 1967 as a house of the year. The property consists of a main house and a smaller guest house in a complementary form and style. This small compound ser served as a rural retreat for the Case family and their guests for nearly half a century. The buildings have many modern elements, as well as reflecting emerging postmodern architectural influences, but also show influences from traditional vernacular architectural forms and materials in their use of space, massing, and choice of materials, which the architect referred to as, quote, a common barn building vernacular. The complex appears to be an early example of a style that became known as the shed style, which combines simplified geometric masses with rustic, usually naturally stained wood finishes. <clears throat> the complex is the work of architect Willis N. Mills, Jr., the Princeton-trained architect and son of modernist architect Willis N. Mills, Sr. of New Canaan, Connecticut. Willis, Jr. joined his father's firm, SMS Architects, in 1963, shortly after designing the Case House. He eventually became president of the firm and specialized in a number of other notab notable commissions during his career in New Canaan, specializing in residences and libraries. So here's a, a, to a topographical view. This is the main house here, and it's set so that it really looks over the landscape. You can see this is quite a dramatic sort of slope downwards, um, and this is the guest house here. <coughs> Common to mid 20th century architecture, the main house and guest house are clearly inter internally divided to separate private activities, such as sleeping, from public entertainment spaces. The case house is a symmetrical building consisting of two cross-shaped elements mirrored in their forms connected by a flat roof glass-walled hyphen. The hyphen contains more intermediary spaces including entry, storage, a breakfast nook, and a playroom. The east unit of the living room and the the east unit is the living room, or the living area, and the west unit is the sleeping area. The living portion was meant to be more public, allowing for open entertaining, while the sleeping area was intended to serve as the private family quarters. The complex, whoops, the complex remained in the ownership of James H. Case III until 2003, when it was purchased by his, a second, uh, as a second home by a new buyer, who then sold it to the current owners in 2016. After more than 50 years of ownership by only two families and limited use as a second home, the building retains almost all of its original features as an excellent example of the architect's work and of 1960s architecture. And to prove that, I just wanted to quickly compare a few of the images that were featured in the 1967 article with what it looks like today, just so you get a sense of it. So this is the, the article here. So this is a view of the kitchen in the main house. This is it in the 1960s. This is it now. The owners apologized that they uh, painted it the cork or the uh, pegboard surface blue when it was originally green. Here's a view into the main uh, sort of entertaining spaces here. This is the music room area with the circular staircase. And the sort of the anchor of this area is a really large fireplace, which sort of has this, this, this ceiling here is actually a projecting balcony that kind of creates a, a private kind of more confined space in, in, you know, you can see the rest of the vaulted ceilings beyond. And here are some of the bedrooms for the area. This, as a second house, this house has more storage space than any house I've ever seen in my entire life. It's amazing. Um, so they have these walls of built-in closets, um, but the bedrooms are pretty small and, you know. And here's another view of the, the living area. Um, this is the music room area. And here's a view that shows the guest house. And you can really start to see the shed style influence playing out, especially in the guest house, the way it sort of works into the landscape a little bit. It's multi-tiered. Um, and then you start to see these projecting clear story windows, which are really characteristic of what you know, would become identified as the shed style. And here's a view from inside the, the guest house that shows the, the real integrity right down to these pendant light fixtures are still intact, which is pretty amazing. Whoops. So that is the case house. Are there any questions on this? Yeah, yeah it was really, this is a really strong form of good nomination. Well, Emily Gould started a lot of the legwork on this one. This was a, a, pa a passion project of sorts for her, so.
Yeah, it's a real hidden gem. Would someone like to move this? Second. Uh, Eric, you got second. All in favor, please. All in favor. Aye. Aye. All in favor. So the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church complex is significant as an example of a parish complex that reflects changing architectural trends over nearly 70 years of development from the late 19th through the mid 20th century. The complex is being nominated under criterion C in the area of architecture and under criterion A in the area of social history. The Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church Complex was established in the mid-19th mid century to serve the, a growing residential community that had recently developed in the surrounding area due to its proximity to the Suspension Bridge, an important connection between the U.S. and Canada completed in 1855. In that same year, Bishop Tymon authorized the establishment of a mission church to serve the budding neighborhood of Suspension Bridge, and the first church on the site was completed in 1856. So Sacred Heart Church Complex consists of four contributing buildings, including a church, located right here, a rectory, which is back here, a convent, which is here, and the school. And this, an addition was added to the rear of the school in 1960, which is not shown, but it, it extends back into this property here. <clears throat> so the Gothic Re Revival Church anchors the complex, built in 1889 by Michael Sheehan to replace the older church on the same site which had been destroyed by a fire the previous year. The complex, is, it, the complex is significant for the school building designed in a restrained Italian Renaissance style in 1900 by architects Orchard and Giralamon and later expanded with a modern style addition in 1960. It demonstrates the evolution of school architecture through the mid 20th century period. The complex also includes two excellent examples of Romanesque revival style residences affiliated with the church, a convent built in 1907 and a rectory built in 1910, both constructed by Egan and Cox. The church, convent, and rectory are distinctive examples of the respective styles and types accommodating the needs of a growing and active parish. Together, these four buildings demonstrate not only a varied collection of architectural styles, but also the growth of the Sacred Heart Parish in North Niagara Falls from the late 19th to the mid 20th century. By the time the present church was constructed in 1889, this community was growing and expanding significantly as a re result of industrial development occurring in Niagara Falls. The construction of the school, convent, and rectory indicates the need to expand the church campus in order to provide all of the necessary services to this growing community in the early 20th century and into the mid 20th century when the parish membership re reached its zenith. Serving as an excellent collection of religious architectural styles as they developed over the, over the time, the period of significance for the S Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church complex is 1889 to 1960. This period begins when the church was constructed and includes the construction of the school in 1900, the convent in 1907, and the rectory in 1910. The year 1960 marks the end of the period of significance when the rear addition to the school was completed, and really after that marks sort of a period of decline for, for the church complex. Um, I will note that the church itself is now still being used as a, a place of worship by a different congregation, um, and the other buildings are candidates for tax credit projects. So, uh, so the church is still a church? The church is still a church. Is it a Catholic church? It, no, I don't believe it is. Okay, I talked to somebody who used to be in this congregation recently, and they were so heartbroken that this is no longer a Catholic church complex. I, yeah. yeah, well, as you're very aware, there's, yeah, there's so a large aware. wave of Catholic church yeah, closings, and, and right, so this, this was a part of one of those waves of closings, so. But it's good that it found a new use, and yeah. the lights are still on, and the heat is still on, so. So this is the Sacred Heart Roman Catholic Church complex. Are there any questions on this? Any questions about the former nomination? I'll move it. Anybody want to second? Uh, I think Wayne got that one. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Opposed, abstain. Carries. All right, back to modernism. 
So Delaware Avenue Medical Center in Buffalo is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as a representative example of a mid-century mid medical office building rendered in a modest international style. Developed by Bernard King of King Home Builders and designed by prominent local firm Bacchus Crane and Love, the Delaware Avenue Medical Center contributed to Buffalo's expanding medical industry in the post-war era upon its completion in 1958. When the facility opened for business, it represented modern American medical advancements and service. The building typified the post-war wave of medical office buildings. So here it is under construction. Medical office buildings emerged in the early 20th century in concurrence with advancements in professionalization and specialization in the medical field. By 1935, the cost of medical education grew and medicine became a profession of the privileged. Specialization was stressed and highly esteemed in the medical community, while the reliance on the general practitioner or the family doctor in the, medical, or in, in the family doctor diminished. General practitioners and family doctors began to be prevented from performing hospital work, medical procedures, and other activities. In addition to the changing medical practice, advancements in the field of medicine itself began to also change the way the facilities were used. New antibiotics reduced the likelihood of post-operative infection, and contemporary anesthetics hastened the patient's recovery from surgery, making long hospital stays less necessary and less common. Procedures that had taken place in the hospital in the late 19th and early 20th century were now being relocated to adjunct sites that were more convenient, easier to find, and with a more commercial atmosphere. The post-war ideology centered around a type of design that offered easy accessibility to a single facility, a sort of one-stop shopping approach that would successfully meet all of a family's health care needs. Located adjacent to the Millard Fillmore Hospital at Gates Circle, the Delaware Avenue Medical Center reflected common design elements of this building type, with 70 office suites containing a variety of practices, a pharmacy, optician's office, snack bar, elevators, and air conditionings. It was hailed as one of the most modern medical centers in the country when it opened in 1958. The use of the international style suited the image and function of the Delaware Avenue Medical Center the clean, modern aesthetic appealed to the medical industry's concern for modern technology and sanitary conditions, while the structural fr frame afforded flexible interiors appropriate for speculative office development. The building retains character-defining features such as the re rectangular footprint and ribbon windows that assert its functional and efficient design. So a few views of the interior, the lobby is simple, but, but really intact to the mid-century. Um, basically, the, the footprint would be the, the central corridor that ran the length of the building, and then there would be offices uh, that would always change and, and sort of speculatively built um, within. So, so this is the Delaware Avenue Medical Center. Are there any questions on this? The, light, the window banks are intended to draw natural light in as much as possible? Absolutely. I mean, you get a sense of that. This is a corner unit here, um, but there are... There are wide open and it allowed for a changing floor plan inside if you needed a smaller office you still had a window if you had fewer windows that would dictate more of your footprint so questions are you are you moving she's moving <laughs> eric uh, second the motion chuck all in favor Aye. opposed or abstain All right, now I'm going to Schenectady. Wow. And I, <laughs> as I said, this is an exercise to get me to learn how to spell Schenectady. So the Alexandra Apartment Hotel is a five-story Queen Anne-style multi-unit residential building whose construction was associated with the growth of downtown Schenectady in the early 20th century. The Alexandra Apartment Hotel is locally significant under Criterion C in the area of architecture as an example of a apartment hotel typology. The building also broadly reflects the type of multi-unit dwellings erected throughout Schenectady to accommodate General Electric's growing workforce and is locally significant under Criterion A in the area of social history. The period of significance for the Alexandra Apartment Hotel stretches from 1900 until circa 1923. These dates encompass the entire period during which the building functioned as an apartment hotel. After after around 1923, the Alexandra was used as a more traditional apartment house. The period of significance also corresponds to the era during which General Electric employees made up the vast majority of the residents, reflecting the building's importance as an upscale living space, space for GE's white collar employees and technical experts. So here it is under construction. 
Due to the rapid expansion of the General Electric Company between 1887 and the 1910s, thousands of people moved to Schenectady and the city experienced a boom in housing, boom in housing construction. The Alexandra was built in 1900 and targeted a clientele that primarily consisted of employees from GE, whose industrial works were only a short trolley ride away from the building. During its first 20 years, the Alexandra primarily attracted GE employees who wanted to live near the Stockade neighborhood, which is actually kind of just behind it. Uh, Schenectady's most distinguished residential neighborhood. Many of these tenants were well-educated te technicians and sought lodgings that reflected their position of prominence within the company. As a building type, the apartment hotel fused design elements from apartment houses and, and hotels, catering to a clientele that sought the homey feeling of, of an apartment, as well as the dining and service amenities of a hotel. Like apartments, apartment hotel units were built to maximize rentable space and light exposure. But the first floor of an apartment hotel most resembled a hotel and generally contained dining rooms and lounges, giving guests a common space in which to relax. So the Alexandra retains these key features that distinguish apartment hotels from other multi-person unit building types. The building's first floor retains evidence of its original configuration, despite some later alteration and infill, and the original layout of the building's upper floor suites are intact. So this is the Alexandra Apartment Hotel. Are there any questions? Uh, I like the use of historic maps and photos in this uh, nomination. Uh, the photo log is blank in the nomination. We usually finalize yeah. those afterwards when we kind of look through the photos and Thank you. Thank you. I should note all four of those projects involve tax credits, including the Case House, which is going to be a homeowner tax credit. <laughs> Last and certainly not least, uh, this is the James Baldwin residence on West 71st Street in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, and this is our sixth um, nomination under the LGBT underrepresented properties um, grants. I'm pleased to say we just got a third grant um, to do two more nominations and to be war awarded a grant in each of the three rounds of this um, uh, competition is a very high compliment to the um, scholars and to the project in general, so we're all very pleased with that. So the Baldwin residence is exceptionally significant under Criterion B and Criteria Consideration G in the areas of literature and social history for its association with the prominent American author and activist James Baldwin during the final phase of his life, 1965 to 1987, when he owned this house and it served as his primary American residence. James Baldwin made profound and enduring contributions to American literature and social history. As a gay black author, civil rights activist, and social commentator, Baldwin transformed discussions about race and sexuality in America and abroad. He was an ever-present figure in the literary, political, and social circles of his time. He spoke critically and engagingly with everyone from heads of state to ordinary people, and his biographer called him the most prominent writer to chronicle and critique the U.S. civil rights movement. Baldwin was born in Harlem in 1924, and during his childhood and early literary career, which is throughout the, um, up to the late 1940s, he lived in several apartments in Harlem and Greenwich Village, where he published his early works. However, due in large part to racial tension in the United States, and especially to personal persecution in his native New York, Baldwin lived and worked primarily in France after the 1940s. Despite his physical exile, most of his work continued to center on New York and on America's ongoing struggles with race. Um, in the late 1950s, Baldwin began his active involvement with the civil rights movement. He began returning to the states. He made a number of trips to the south. He met Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Bayard Rustin, and many others, other civil rights leaders, and he took part in the 1963 March on Washington and in the 1965 Voting Rights March to Selma and Montgomery, where this photo was taken with Bayard Rustin, who's sitting to, um, to his right. 
Um, he said he was very moved by these trips and encounters. He felt he should do something, that he had found his calling, and he said that after he had met these leaders, um, he had to go back to America because he knew what his role was, that he could get a story past an editor, and that once he realized that he could do something to help, it would have been hard to live with himself if he didn't. And as a result, his extensive body of work in the last period of his life focusing, focuses on themes of great relevance to the major questions that America faced in those decades, and his establishment of a permanent residence in New York in this period corresponds with his decision to speak and write publicly about the civil rights movement in those decades. He was also very close to his family, including his mother, his sisters, and their children, and he was deeply connected to New York City, and he considered it his home. And so thus he purchased and moved into this building on the Upper West Side in 1965. His mother and other relatives also lived there both during his lifetime, and they continued to live there for decades after his death. Um, this is the New York City residence associated with him for the longest period of time during his adult life and the place most closely associated with his activities involving African American and gay civil rights. The building itself was constructed in 1890 as a single family home, but in 1961, a few years before Baldwin's residence, it was completely redesigned in a modern aesthetic and divided into apartments by architect H. Russell Kenyon. Changes included removing the facade, recladding it with white glazed brick, changing the fenestration by grouping metal double hung windows on the upper floors to suggest picture windows. The entrance was re relocated to the ground level where a new sunken modern glass and aluminum door was set within a gray granite surround. Glass blocks were used in the large basement window opening to provide both light and privacy. The exterior is almost pristinely intact to Baldwin's period. The interior was divided into 10 small one-bedroom apartments, two in the basement and two on each upper floor. Each apartment had simple plaster walls and no moldings or other decoration. Baldwin's mother lived in 1B on the floor above his. His sister Gloria lived in 4A. Both of those apartments retained their overall configuration and all the apartments retained fixtures or features such as ceiling heights and windows. Um, public spaces had simple modern finishes, including a vestibule with a terrazzo floor and small square glass tiles. The halls had terrazzo floors and plaster walls. There's a narrow, wooden, there's a narrow stair with an aluminum uh, rail. It's all very simple, and all of those features survive in the public spaces. Now, Baldwin lived in apartment B, which is the um, basement floor rear. It was a... Uh, 600 foot square L-shaped two room unit with access to the backyard. And these are those two spaces. Um, you entered through the rear hall door into the living room, which is shown on the left. And you entered through the door, the rear hall door, which is where that is Ken Lusbader standing there in the red sweater. Um, and that's the living room. And there was a galley kitchen to the right of the entry where the piano is. Um, and I don't know, the door was cut into the front apartment sometime in the 90s. I don't know when the galley kitchen was removed. The image to the right is Baldwin's bedroom. So simply turning, the photographer simply turned around and faced into the bedroom. Where there was a window and a door to the garden, as there still is, however, the door looks like a replacement. Now, even though the wall between the two rooms has been removed, you can see where it was. Obviously, it was a bad idea because they had to put up those two supports. Um, columns between it. Um, however, the two-room configuration is still readable. Like the other apartments, this space would have had plain plaster walls, no moldings or other decoration, and just a simple kitchen. It was a very small, very plain space, and it remains a very small, very plain space. It is understandable as the apartment it was, and it retains a sense of functional and spatial integrity, even though today Baldwin's entire apartment is part of a duplex that includes the first floor. There is a stair between the two spaces. During the period Baldwin lived here, this apartment was much more than a space to eat, sleep, and write. Rather, the apartment and the entire house itself, due to Baldwin's relatives living on the upper floor, was a vital hub for family and for black civil rights activists and jazz and literary figures. Now, I have a few photos that are actually stills from an interview that was um, 
done with Baldwin and his family in the house. Um, they show him with friends and family. Here he's being interviewed, and some think that this interview took place in the apartment itself. And this is his mother in her apartment on the floor above. And these two shots, so you can just see how simple these spaces were, even from what we can see just in the sills. These are two different shots of Baldwin. He's in the blue shirt on the left and in the yellow shirt on the right, and that's also his mother on the right. These are two different family gatherings. Um, they are probably in his mother's apartment. We don't know for sure. And the pictures on this contact sheet are him, actually him in the backyard. We have a lot of recollections from Baldwin's niece about the kind of literary and social activity that took place here. She recalled that people from all walks of life seemed to sense his imminent arrival and flocked to 71st Street knowing they would find him here. Some followed him home from speaking engagements to extend their time in his presence. She also recalled his joyous arrivals as celebratory, saying that the energy and vitality at 137 elevated to a fever pitch as soon as he hit the door. Even before he arrived, the house was set up blaze with excitement and anticipation. Jimmy's coming could be heard all throughout the house as her grandmother, mother, and aunt ran up and down the stairs of the small white brick four-story apartment building preparing for the onslaught of visitors. She went on to describe food, friendship, fellowship, and extended family descending on the home. She talked about notable black literary figures arriving here, some of whom she named, including her aunt Toni Morrison, who lived there for a time, and she called them all her extended family. She shared accounts of the many deep conversations about important topics. She talked about whether the FBI was listening, which was one of the topics they talked about. So um, there was a lot of activity involving many notable people that took place during this house every time Baldwin was there. Um, she, um, she, during, this, during his period of residence here, here, eight of Baldwin's works were performed or televised. He published 14 written works, including novels, essays, plays, screenplays, dialogues, and a book of poetry. He wrote a children's book featuring his niece and nephew who lived in the house um, based on this house. Um, and his influence was especially notable for black L the black LGBT community. He spoke publicly on, on homosexuality, racism within the LGBT community, and homophobia. He also wrote several major no novels here featuring gay or bisexual characters. Um, when he died in France on December 1st, he, uh, he was, his body was returned here. His funeral was at St. John the Divine. Crowds of people came to honor him, and he was eulogized by Maya Angelou, Toni Morrison, and Amory Bar Baraka. So more than 30 years after his death, Baldwin's work and commentary continue to be relevant and rev in discussions regarding marginalized communities. And if you saw the movie last year, I Am Not Your Negro, um, the context related in that film is very much the context of Baldwin's life during the period he, in which he lived in this house. So because this building is the center of Baldwin's family and intellectual life during the final 30 years of his career, perhaps his period of greatest significance and relevance uh, on American cultural history, this resource best represents his contribution to American life. I have a letter of support from LPC, and I have a support um, signature from the owner. Any questions about the Baldwin House? With all that being the case, why is it only local significance? Well, um, it probably should be national win. Um, the integrity is a little questionable. We have not been in every apartment. Um, I was, again, just like the, um, the Rockwell Kent, I wanted to be sure it got through. But I do think it probably is. It certainly, I feel it's nationally significant. It's his most important American residence. Yeah. And um, I think probably his most influential and significant period in American cultural history. I think, I, I think that the scholar who wrote number eight did a fabulous job. I, was, I hope you all liked it as much as I did. Yeah. But we had trouble, you know, we weren't quite sure about the integrity. The apartment is just a space. If I certainly I can also, we can have a conversation when we talk about Rockwell Kent with um, NPS about it. I think it's hugely significant, so I, I support Wint on asking that. Yeah. Sorry? It's, a really, it's, it's incredibly significant, so I think that's a good discussion to have. It was also a really good read. I appreciate yeah. it. It's a good read. It's a good read. And I hope and I these hope images will images appear in the document too because I was, that's yeah. fantastic. I guess I can try to get those. I just got those stills. 
Yeah, that'd be, yeah, that'd be nice, nice. Yeah. to get some context. But, um, no, I thought it was very moving, the whole nomination. I yeah. thought number eight was fabulous. But, and it's been, it's, it's being studied for landmark, um, uh, LPC landmarking as well. Kristen Harris here and uh, Lucy as first and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstain? Thank you. That is it. All right. Uh, uh, motion. Motion. Motion to adjourn. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye.